Hello, viewers and or listeners of From Rewatch with Love. The podcast is going to take a one-week hiatus next week while we stage our annual charity fundraising marathon, Desert Bus for Hope. Check out desertbus.org for more information on how you can help us raise money for a wonderful cause, and you can watch the stream there or at twitch.tv slash desertbus. From Rewatch with Love will return on Monday, November 23rd. Thank you. Hello and welcome to From Rewatch with Love, a James Bond cinematic rewatch podcast. My name is Graham Stark. Joining me as always is Matt Wiggins. Hello. And today we are looking at 1997's Tomorrow Never Dies, the second Pierce Brosnan Bond film and following hot on the heels of the wildly successful GoldenEye. And while it was successful in box office terms, briefly, uh, $110 million budget, which is about $178 million. You know, we're getting, we're getting, we're getting a, a lot closer <laughs> in terms of the inflation calculation. Is that a $200 million budget? Like a $170 million budget on this? Yeah. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, it's the expanding rate of movie budgets over the years, right? It's out of control. I guess so, yeah. Bringing in 333 million or 539 million adjusted for inflation, but was the only Pierce Brosnan Bond film not to open at number 1 the weekend of its release because it had the sheer misfortune to open the same weekend as a little something called Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to get overshadowed, isn't it? Yeah, it's actually probably the more relevant, but second way in which they were just behind Titanic. And I can talk a little bit more about that later because it's <laughs> just kind of funny. Now, Matt, if I were to say to you, having having watched the movie just very recently, as of course you yes. may rewatch just before we were not just before we record, but within a few days of recording, yeah. if I were to tell you that there were production issues behind the scenes, what would your reaction to that be? No way. <laughs> a, a, a very unsurprised. Yeah, like I there were production issues behind the scenes. And when I heard that it was not like for me it was not like a oh well that explains it moment it mm -hmm. was just sort of like oh that tracks yeah so uh, this movie's not bad no right it comes together fine it's functional and and like it doesn't show a lot of seams of you know sometimes like a movie is in production hell or there are problems putting it together and you can just tell because the movie that's on screen feels really unfinished and like parts don't flow well into other parts and, and that sort of thing that's mm -hmm. not the case here the movie fits together functionally it, it, it's not like the movie is really wearing the scars of what production issues i'm sure you're going to tell us about but <laughs> i am not at all surprised to learn that was the case yeah it just it it doesn't seem to have the same level of sort of care and attention that Goldeneye did. Yeah. You know, like it's it's not, as you say, it's not like, oh, that explains all these massive problems and holes and stuff that sort of doesn't track and add up. But at the same time, it's sort of like, oh, that explains why it's like just maybe not as clean and not as smooth from a variety of different perspectives mm -hmm. as, for example, Goldeneye was. So part of the problem is, and you'll know this, and I'm sure some people listening will know this, but it's difficult to rush creativity mm -hmm. and having a release date set in mind is very common for movies. You know, the studio will be like, we want to hit this weekend. So that's when you have to do it by. Apparently there had been a sale in the mid nineties of United Artists and the owner at the time was like, I want a Bond film to land at this time. So it looks good to investors. Right. Which is, I would say, a level worse than we're hoping to hit this weekend in the summer because <laughs> we think it'll be a good release weekend. As it turns out, right. it also, you know, wasn't a good release weekend because of Titanic, even though this made more than Goldeneye. So they had their release date locked in uh, very early on and didn't have a huge amount of time 
to do the movie from the director's commentary he talks about how they were editing the film while shooting which again the bond films tend to have a very long principal photography span like this was like 125 days or something but it's still sort of unusual to be putting the plane together as it's in flight the biggest problem was that they had a script. What a problem. <laughs> well, the, the the problem was the script written by Bruce Fierstein, who was one of the co-writers of GoldenEye, was centered around Hong Kong. And in the summer of 1997, i.e. in the middle of when they would be doing principal photography, was due to be the Hong Kong handover. Right. When the United Kingdom relinquished control, essentially, of Hong Kong. And so the studio was like, Let's maybe not do that. And they sent the script back for a major revision. They're like, change it completely. Don't make it about Hong Kong in case that goes weird. And we don't want to, you know, we don't want to do that. We don't want you to be in the middle of principal photography and then, oh crap, everything's gone pear-shaped. So Bruce Fierstein was like, okay, I have to completely redo the script, but they had already started ramping into pre-production. And so the director, uh, Roger Spotswood, talks about, how they sort of isolated a few scenes that they could start the various departments working on because they'd already hired people to start working on the movie. Right. The, I don't know. Do you, can you guess the four scenes that they maintained from the original script? <sighs> so I, I'm guessing like the ship bound scenes like the naval scenes or the scenes on the the stealth ship it's way less specific it's so you're close the sinking of the devonshire okay which happens right after the opening titles the pre-title because that's sort of self-contained right yeah and then a car chase and a motorcycle chase <laughs> and then they were just like great take these start storyboarding We'll get you the rest of the script while we can. And it's kind of funny because they had asked Martin Campbell to come back and direct. And he had decided that he didn't want to do two Bond films back to back. Right. Went to direct Mask of Zorro. And originally, Anthony Hopkins was cast as the villain of Tomorrow Never Dies. <laughs> walked off after three days because it was chaos because there was no completed script. Right. And then went. <laughs> it went instead to be in the mask of zorro <laughs> so which did mean that roger spotswood the director got his first choice for the character of elliot carver which is jonathan price who we'll talk about later but yeah yeah it's like what a different movie this would have been with anthony hopkins in that role yeah what, what a different movie it would have been if they'd like had everything written ahead of time rather than yeah you know kind of like doing a scramble and like you say like it comes together fine it's not like oh this is obviously sort of laying the track while the train is driving how many different automotive <laughs> metaphors can i can i get out of this it's uh, laying the track while the airplane's flying is is really what you need to hit exactly but it definitely just sort of is like yep it sure does hit all the notes and mm -hmm doesn't necessarily land in the big way that I would have liked. Yeah, I, I think calling it by the numbers is fair. Everything's there and everything works. But in the, in the way that we sort of discussed with GoldenEye, where like everything feels like it's done with care and there are cute little character moments that, that like in the case of, of Wade, right? Like mm -hmm. his, you, you pointed out how every scene he had some comment on plants and it was just a little character quirk that existed for him in that movie. It does not exist in this film. Yeah, I was so disappointed. And all of those little like flourishes that indicate an extent of care beyond just like we need to get something functional on the page are sort of not there yeah so it's not it's not a bad bond film it's certainly not the worst one we've looked at i just don't think it's amazing mm -hmm. but i mean we'll talk more about it i guess as we're going along so i suppose let's start going along let's start going along we have the gun barrel sequence open up on a already a less dynamic opening shot than the plane from golden knight there's a lot of, it's hard to not to do a lot of direct comparisons when this is two years on mm -hmm. and it's you know it's the same it's a lot of the same kind of tone i mean it's obviously it's pierce brosnan again but it's a very similar sort of opening anyway we're on rather than a chemical weapons facility a terrorist arms bazaar on the russian border <laughs> 
which is i don't know if this caption was strictly necessary but you know fine there are a few captions in this movie that don't feel strictly necessary and then there are a few points where a caption would have benefited it and they don't do it (laughs) (laughs) so we see a whole bunch of uh, trucks and a couple planes and you know massive av carts full of weapons and the camera pans down and we see a really obvious like should be super visible spy camera taking footage of all of this i like how you comment this is like a a less dynamic opening but that camera is moving (laughs) they needed to do something to make those scenes have some kind of like activity or motion so it's like zooming in and out and tilting up and down and like going like mad in all of the shots of the camera and then we get the footage from the camera and it's all stationary pans (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah we find out momentarily that this camera is being operated by bond well it takes a while actually for that to come out it's assumed that this camera is being operated by bond and apparently there was a scene that they'd intended to film of him climbing up like an ice fall to get mm. into this position to be sort of the marquee stunt akin to the bungee jump at the very beginning of goldeneye but they right. couldn't, couldn't make it work so they sort of start more in media's res We go to the video room, I guess, at MI6, where everyone is watching this footage. And by everyone, I mean M and a couple of new characters. Because Michael Kitchen was unable to return as Bill Tanner, the chief of staff, we instead have Colin Salmon as Robinson, who would appear in the rest of the Pierce Brosnan movies as sort of not the chief of staff, but like, I don't know, M's right hand as far as these movies are concerned colin salmon has been in a bunch of other stuff a lot of paul ws anderson movies huh he's in several of the resident evil movies yeah he's he's the guy that gets like cubed in the first re movie yeah but somehow reappears later (laughs) i don't know exactly how that works i've sort of fallen off them a little bit i can't imagine why yeah you're a fan of 24 he plays general coburn in 24 live another day yes he was in Punisher War Zone, which is a great movie that everybody should watch. <laughs> was that the- we didn't include Punisher War Zone in Countdown to Infinity because it's technically not an MCU movie, but it was a Marvel film that came out in 2008 along with Iron Man and the Incredible Hulk. But it's it's technically it was done under a different label. It was done under the Marvel Knights label. But he's in that as like the long suffering police captain, I think. Weird. I mentioned the Paul W.S. Anderson movies, not just Resident Evil. He was also, I think, in the Three Musketeers movie. And I want to say some other one. Is he in Monster Hunter? No, he's not. Okay. Anyway. Apparently, he's General Zod in the Krypton TV series. Yes, that is correct. Huh. Yeah. Oh, right. He was also in AVP. That's the other Paul W.S. Anderson movie. He was in Alien vs. Predator. Ah. So I guess they get along well. Also in this scene is Admiral Roebuck, played by Jeffrey Palmer, who is just sort of, I mean, to me, he's just like a guy that I recognize from like a bajillion British things. Right. Most notably, most amusing to me anyway, his role as Lionel Hardcastle in As Time Goes By, which is a long running, much beloved UK series about two older people who were young lovers sort of reconnecting after both separating unintentionally and both becoming married. And then I think there was one of them got divorced and the other one became became widowed and then reconnecting later in life and sort of rekindling that relationship. And it's him and Judy Dench. <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so it's like, cause they kind of act like an old married couple in this movie. Yeah. 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 You're given that whole spiel. And I'm like, it's Judy Dench, isn't it? It's Judy Dench. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and this was 1997 and as time goes by I only started in 1992 so it's like this is it's you know fresh right right but they kept doing as time goes by specials until 2005 huh i'm not going to go deep on it i think it started as like a more serial tv series and then they would do occasional specials but the, the right. point is the most recent as time goes by production was 2005 anyway i just i i found that very funny roebuck does not appear in any other bond films so it's a little weird poor guy he, he must have retired from the, the royal navy in between this and the next film so they are watching the footage from your man or our man they don't say bond they just talk about the man in the field he's got a code name i think he's he's the white knight white knight yeah because they're all using chess chess code names for this operation 
Yeah. And they pinpoint a couple different guys. They're like, oh, that guy's a terrorist. That guy's a terrorist. We know who that is. And they mentioned one of them, Henry Gupta, who will be relevant to the story further on. They basically decide, oh, you know what we should do? We should just um, we should just call in an airstrike, just wipe out all of these terrorists all at once. And M's like, uh, I don't really know about that. And Roebuck is like, no, we're, we're going to do that. So he gets on the phone to a naval ship and he's there also with his Russian equivalent. And they're like, OK, let's just blow these dudes up because this is on the Russian border. And it's like, look, you don't want this. We don't want this. Let's just let's just shut this whole thing down. Look at all these terrorists we get for just one missile. Isn't that great? <laughs> <laughs> and you know he says all right we'll pull your man out of there and robinson is like what what's going on what yes no i can see it like robinson's obviously talking to white knight who whomever that is it's james bond and he's like yeah i know what what's what's the problem and bond keeps telling him to look at one at the thing that he's pointing the camera at and then eventually they realize that one of the planes that is there has russian nuclear missiles on it and so they realize that if they blow up those missiles while they won't necessarily detonate because i don't think that's how those actually work i again i didn't research how nuclear missiles work but i don't believe you you don't have to they say it in the like in the scene yeah because exactly. they're like will that set those off and they're like no but there's enough plutonium in them that it'll render the area uninhabitable for a period of decades yeah they talk about like you know like it'll be chernobyl times a hundred you know whatever it is <laughs> <laughs> he does say like some number of times worse than Chernobyl. Yeah. They call in to destroy the missile, but they can't because the missile's out of range. So it's going and there's nothing they can do about it. So then Robinson is like, you got to get out of there. You got to get out of there. And he doesn't respond. And then they see they see on their camera Bond running <laughs> right into this terrorist arms bazaar. And Robux says, what's that man doing? And M says, his job. Q action scene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is honestly, you know, all right, great. Perfect. You know. So Bond, through distraction and, you know, blowing up some stuff to just sort of cause chaos, manages to run through the terrorist arms bazaar <laughs> and eventually steals the plane, like gets into the plane. There's a guy in the co-pilot seat and he knocks him out with his helmet, gets in the plane and, you know, <laughs> takes off with it. I mean, like this goes on for some time. There's a lot of sort of taxiing around the runway, shooting people and there's tension of getting up to speed before the missile actually gets there. There's a lot of shots, both like POV and with some like a CG or model missile flying through the mountains on its way there. It makes some very impressive corners. Yeah, yeah. There's there's another plane, which they conveniently color coded for of your ability to tell them apart, which is great. But there's like there's another plane piloted by another terrorist that like tries to block Bond's way as he's taxiing on the runway. And they like joust their planes as Bond tries to take off eventually bond and the other plane do take off some number of the terrorists having been spooked by bond's distractions manage to escape including mr gupta but there is a colossal explosion really cool location for this just this weird angled runway at the top of a mountain yeah so i have questions yeah i have questions how did the second plane take off I, I don't know because they make a big point about how Bond is like just about to take off and then there's this huge explosion and everyone at MI6 is like, oh no, he's dead. And then he yeah. says, ba -da, ba -da, like out of the fireball you know his plane just manages to escape barely bond had to taxi all the way to the end of this runway turn around and take off uphill <laughs> and the plane that he flies over is taxiing down the runway at the time and he only just makes it out of the like the mechanics of the scene make no sense whatsoever <laughs> but it's still tons of fun <laughs> the guy in the co-pilot seat behind bond regains consciousness and tries to strangle him Bond does this thing where he flies, he, he pilots his plane while struggling to be not strangled, flies his plane under the other plane and ejects his co-pilot who fires up and then through the bottom of the other plane, <laughs> like into the same seat. It just like out of the co-pilot seat in his plane into the co-pilot seat in the other plane presumably supremely dead as a result oh yeah i commented to meg when i watched this that like oh bond has just torn his own head off <laughs> Because he's being garroted by this guy who's got like a cable around his his neck when he fires the eject button. 
Meg is like, well, I guess the guy let go. <laughs> <laughs> One has to assume, yeah. But it would just take his head off like a cake slicer. Like, it's very silly. Bond radios in because they think he's dead still. Bond radios in and is like, you know, white knight to Rook or whoever. Where does the general want his missiles delivered? <laughs> And then Roebuck lo- or Admiral, General or Admiral, whatever. Roebuck looks a little embarrassed and M allows herself a small smile. <laughs> and then as we move close in on the engine of the jet plane we transition to the opening titles. And this is the first opening titles to bear the words Albert R Broccoli's Eon Productions presents because mm. of course this is the first movie that Broccoli was not with us for. The movie is dedicated to his memory, but going forward it would be Albert R Broccoli's Eon Productions presents James Bond. Right. Opening titles. Huh. So <laughs> John Barry Longtime James Bond composer mm-hmm. was asked to return to score the movie. I don't know why Eric Serra didn't return or was not asked to return from Goldeneye, but they asked John Barry back. One of the problems that made him not want to return is that they had already begun working on the opening title song. Okay. He didn't like that he couldn't have input on it. Right. So he was, you know, that as well as like not being able to agree on a fee and everything and whatever. So he ended up not doing it. So they asked another composer, David Arnold, to come on board and he agreed, but he was also not happy about not having input into the main title theme. The main title theme, Mm. by the way, is Tomorrow Never Dies, performed by Sheryl Crow, co-written by her and Mitchell Froome. And I guarantee you have forgotten what it sounds like unless you're listening to it right now. I absolutely have. (laughs) No, you're right. It is a dull song. So what David Arnold did is he said, well, I'm going to make my own main title theme for this song with Blackjack and Hookers. (laughs) And he got KD Lang to sing it. And it's called Surrender, even though the chorus of it is Tomorrow Never Dies. And it's in the end credits of this movie and is way, way better. (laughs) Way better. Still not good. Still not great, but certainly better. It's much more of a belter than this, which this song, Tomorrow Never Dies with Sheryl Crow, technically, I think, falls into the belter category. It's just very, very low key. Yeah. You know what? I don't even think this is a bad song. It's just relatively low energy compared to the scene that we've just exited and the movie that we're going to go into. And it just it's there. (laughs) Like, it's just a song that's there. It's upstaged by the visuals, which is rare for a Bond movie to this point. It's not the last movie where the song will be upstaged by the visuals, but the like (laughs) the visual treatment for this one is, I think, quite interesting. The motif that they go with of having like all these weapons in x-ray but done in these pastel colors i think is really cool like all of this equipment going transparent so you can see the mechanics of it Mm -hmm. all very cool and and they're doing this like motion capture thing of a woman made out entirely out of circuits the cg for which doesn't hold up very well but like visually is quite interesting to look at and it's just neat i think they really went all in on the visual treatment for this one and the song just goes in one ear and completely out the other it (laughs) evaporates from your brain i completely agree with everything that you said there yeah i think the visual treatment is really interesting interestingly i think this the circuitry women hold up actually fairly well it's that they overlay it with the like there's these floating windows that show you the woman that the motion was captured from that it's just it's it seems very 90s in an incredibly dated way i don't mind the circuitry women but i definitely like all the x-ray weaponry and syringes and like medical stuff i think that's really cool and there's a lot of motifs of televisions like screens with static and like really really close up on crt phosphors and stuff which is like thematically relevant to the movie and yeah visually i think it's actually i came around on it i was initially like like, oh, this is a lot. And then I was like, actually, this is, it is a lot, but it's actually, it's actually pretty sweet. But yeah, I could not, I literally have Katie Lang's Tomorrow Never Dies, the song called Surrender, stuck in my head. Just that, just that <laughs> refrain. But I right. could not tell you a damn thing about Cheryl Crow's song. <laughs> well, I, I am listening to Cheryl Crow's song right now, and, and I will forget it immediately as soon as I'm not. <laughs> 
but I like I want to reiterate it's not a bad song like as I say I am listening to it in the background right now because that happens to be where I'm at in the the video and yeah I would say it's a belter it like it has a good tune it has a a neat orchestration to it which I like I don't really dislike anything about the song it's just it is a total nothing song yeah after the titles we go to the HMS Devonshire in the South China Sea and there's a couple of MIGs flying past it, which are Chinese. The captain of the Devonshire and one of the pilots are having a discussion that's basically like, you're in our ocean jurisdiction. He says, no, we're not. And there was a small detail in the pre-title sequence, which is that one of the devices for sale at the terrorist arms bazaar was a submarine control communication device. It was like a GPS. It was a GPS decoder. Yes. In a little red box. And that's what Henry Gupta made off with in the opening title sequence. And so basically this ship thinks it is one place and it is being told by the Chinese pilot that it is in another and that if they don't move, they will be attacked by the planes. While this back and forth is going on, there is a very cool looking stealth catamaran. <laughs> it's a stealth ship. This ship really exists, I think. Yeah, it was inspired by certainly a real design. Yeah, I believe this was inspired by an actual model kit and then sort of. Oh, that could be accentuated a little bit. But yes. Oh, yeah, it's definitely it is almost certainly based on the Sea Shadow, the U.S. Navy Sea Shadow. But it is not actually that ship. I looked it up. Oh, yeah, yeah. The Sea Shadow, which is also a catamaran that yeah. looks like they took a stealth bomber and sort of bent the wings down, <laughs> <laughs> put it in the water. Before that ship actually appears, we do cut to still in the middle of the scene, the headquarters of the Carver Media Group in Hamburg. We see Henry Gupta using the device that he made away with, doing computer stuff, and then we cut to some obviously computer-generated satellites in the sky. There's a massive Carver Media Group satellite beside a satellite with an American flag on it. And then we cut down to see this stealth ship, inside which they have a seagoing drilling mechanism, which is it's, it's a hell of a device. In Inside the ship are a bunch of Rogers Video employees. <laughs> Sorry, this is a, that's, that's maybe a regional joke, but they're all... <laughs> Deep cut, yeah. They're all just wearing black polo shirts tucked into black slacks. One of whom is very tall and wearing a slightly different shirt, and his name is Stamper, and he's sort of the heavy for the movie, and I guess more on him a little later. And he says that it's working well and he's going to radio in, and so he gets on a video call with someone whose face we don't quite see yet and says that phase one is moving along and we'll move to phase two very soon. Phase one is obviously disrupting the course of this ship, which they have done. It is implied that the ship is indeed where the Chinese pilots are saying they are and they think they are somewhere else. Phase two is putting this bizarre drill mechanism into the water and like swimming it over to the ship and boring it into the side of the ship. And specifically, because their ship is a stealth ship, once that thing gets in the water, the British craft sees the thing coming towards them and assumes that one of the jets must have dropped a torpedo because otherwise there's no way for something to have just appeared in the water. Mm -hmm. So it comes towards the Devonshire and collides with it, causing a massive cascade failure because it's not just colliding with it and exploding, it's cutting a giant hole in the side and allowing acres of water, acres, gallons, some, you know, a volume of water. <laughs> acres of water into the into the boat and then they start piloting this this thing like once the area floods then they pilot this drill they're like all right now take it up yeah let's take it upstairs yeah and so the end result is that the devonshire starts to go down and radios that they've been attacked by chinese fighters and are being sunk in international waters right which the stealth ship knows and is like ah good this is what they said perfect that that was their last transmission that's great. Then they also fire rockets out of the stealth ship and destroy one of the jet fighters so that the Chinese think that the British have done it because the Chinese also don't see the stealth ship. We cut back to this man who we will discover is Carver of the Carver Media Group writing tomorrow's headlines, you know, British sailors killed on the front page of his newspaper. And then he updates it to say British sailors murdered. But he has some question marks in the subhead. And he's like, hey, actually, and radios into Stamper and goes, I need to know how many survivors there are, you know, for the headlines. And then in a part that I don't fully understand, they go outside. So the guys who survive 
survived the Devonshire are all in their life jackets and they've seen that this stealth ship is there. So they start swimming over towards it and then they open the doors underneath the catamaran and Stamper is there with a gun and also a guy with a video camera is there and films Stamper murdering all of the survivors. And it will never come up again. Yeah, okay, thank you. The, the video camera will never come up again. The video camera is probably from a different script treatment. <laughs> well, it's, I, I, like, I also don't understand what, like, he's like, I need to know how many survivors. And so Stamper's like, okay, right, I'll go kill them all. And it's like, so you can just say no survivors because you know. Well, the headline is how many bodies they found machine gunned. Oh, okay. They are trying to create the worst possible international incident here. Although it's never explained how they would have this information. <laughs> <laughs> but they sink the ship and make it look like the Chinese did it. So the British think they're 70 miles from shore. The Chinese think they're 11 miles from shore. The British radio saying we've been sunk by Chinese MiGs. We're in international waters. The Chinese pilots say, oh, you know, we had a MiG blown up by the British 11 miles from shore in our own territorial waters. And then this headline comes out saying that these British soldiers were found murdered where there were 17 survivors of the sinking, but they were all murdered by machine gun using the ammunition that the Chinese Navy uses. Right. Okay. But yeah, why they filmed it is completely not picked up on. Yeah, why they filmed that makes no sense at all, but it's never commented on. So I don't know. It's for Carver's own personal archive. <laughs> so now we see Elliot Carver for real as he has a giant video conference call in this massive network room that's currently empty. No one's there except him and Gupta. And there's this huge video wall. He's having his essentially morning stand up with all of his bureau heads from around the world. He's basically going, all right, so how are we going to manipulate the news to what we want it to be today? So here's here's Elliot Carver. Here's the villain of the movie. He is a media magnate who controls the news and has gotten to the point of now creating the news. And in, in 1997, it was a very provocative idea that was maybe a little close to home. When they recorded the commentary tracks, they were like, it's even more relevant today than it was then. And I would say that when you and I are recording this podcast <laughs> now, it's even more relevant today. <laughs> Uh huh. And I think the only thing that dates it is Carver's obsession with print media because he's like newspapers, magazines, books, and also television because this is before the real explosion of the internet, right? This is 1997. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's sort of the only thing that really dates it. The only other thing I would say that dates it is how like obviously malevolent Carver is. Because, like, the actual arc of history is people more being negligent than malevolent, but leading to this kind of negative impact of the media on our lives. So this is my big problem with Elliot Carver as a character. Why is he doing this? So credit to Jonathan Price. <laughs> oh, yeah. I want to talk about Jonathan Price for a moment. He comes out of the gate of this movie looking for any piece of scenery he can chew on, and he gums it real good. <laughs> he is going 120% from minute one, and I love it. <laughs> he gives a speech early in the movie talking about his life's ambition, and it is the perfect villain speech to give in public. He's like, we are about to unveil our greatest triumph of the Carver Media Group. And why? For power. The power to bring information to unserved communities. And my goal is world domination of the airwaves. <laughs> He's saying the quiet part out loud, but he's saying the loud part even louder so that it muddies his message. That speech is so good because it's like, what is he doing? Well, he wants to take over the world. He's just doing it with a media empire that he has at his disposal to do so and doing it in ways that he can sell as being for the benefit of humankind. But they're clearly not like all of his motives are clearly self-serving. I love Jonathan Price. I think he's great. Most audiences will probably know him as Governor Swan in the Pirates of the Caribbean series. Ah, yes. Yeah. Or High Sparrow in Game of Thrones. And I think he has been announced as being cast as the final regeneration of Prince Philip in The Crown. 
Prince Philip noted Time Lord. Well, because they recast the whole cast every like season or two. <laughs> Okay. And do you watch The Crown? I don't. Okay. That's news to me. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, because it's following the whole life of Queen Elizabeth. Gotcha. So like every time they shift eras, they recast everybody to be appropriate age. Yeah. And yeah, like you're absolutely right. He's He is just like devouring the scenery. But I find the character, I, I don't know. I think the character is an idiot. Like the thing is... <laughs> At the end of the movie, he talks to Bond about like how part of doing this whole thing, starting this war, is that he is going to get all the broadcast rights in China for the next hundred years. Yeah. As if it's a mind bending thing that he's going to achieve. And it's like, okay, for one thing, dude, you're going to be here for like maybe 40 of those. <laughs> Two, that's it? Like, as you already mentioned, and as the first thing I thought of, is that it is profoundly obvious that something weird is going on when Carver Media Group knows about these things that are happening before the international intelligence agencies for the countries involved. Yes. So it's like really, really, really suspicious. <laughs> It's especially funny in the context of Goldeneye, where M has that quip about not getting their bad news from CNN. And then we immediately, two years later, roll into a movie where exactly what is happening is that the news media has bad info before the intelligence community. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What it comes down to for me is that there is a disparity between the means and the end. So let's look at Moonraker. Drax's means are to kill almost all humans on the planet because his end is rebuild the human race from just an absolute baseline of nothing of these amazing people that he's selected. Right. That balances. <laughs> that makes sense, <laughs> right? Yeah. Look at Goldeneye. Trevelyan wants to completely upend the British economy as revenge on the UK for participating in genocide. Right. That tracks. Look at Octopussy. The general wants to cause a war so that Russia can become the dominant force in Europe and Asia. Okay, that's like an ideological thing. Right. That all tracks. Carver is starting an international war. Initiating World War III. So he can report on it and get better ratings. Yeah. That is a disparity <laughs> that doesn't <laughs> land for me. It does make him kind of more evil because <laughs> it's so unjustified and selfish. <laughs> it's just kind of like comically ridiculous i guess so carver is a cartoon character in this movie right like yeah from minute one he is a cartoon villain and so it doesn't bother me as much that his plan is that selfish i mean what bothers me is the believability of it because anybody who looks at elliot carver should be able to be like oh that dude's trying to start world war three <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> and he's doing it so that he can get rich because he says it he says it in as many words. He he has it, the we have not we've only just gotten to the meeting with his like investors and business associates. But he comes to this meeting and is like, "All right, so what news have we got today?" And it's like each of them rattles off some. It's like a specter meeting where numbers <laughs> two through five report in on their devious scheme of the day. <laughs> and he's like, "All right, cool. We'll have it on the six o'clock news." Yeah, exactly. It is. It is. Yeah. One of his check-in people, by the way, you may have recognized him, is producer Michael Wilson. <laughs> Excellent. Who was at the meeting in Goldeneye where right, with yeah. Michigan, yeah. So partway through this meeting, Stamper interrupts and is like, everything's taken care of. They've all been killed with the bullets and everything, and it's all good. And he's like, ah, great. And then tells Gupta to go and safely hide the GPS interference device and then gets to come back and go, stop the presses or hold the presses, I think he says. And then, you know, this is he's like, I want 24 hour coverage. I want newspapers, magazines. I want all of it. You know, we want to dominate the airwaves with this story because he is just about to launch his 24 hour news network, AKA the downfall of Western civilization. Yeah. After that scene, we cut away to Oxford University. Hmm. And Bond is there. You can tell Bond is there because there's an Aston Martin parked outside. It's true. There is an Aston Martin parked outside. I like that they keep bringing the Aston Martin back. Yeah, I like that even though they have a 
auto deal with BMW as the James Bond car. They're like, yeah, but Bond still drives the Aston Martin. Yeah, that's his that's his personal car. MI6 has switched over to outfitting BMWs, but Bond still drives his Aston Martin in his downtime. I like that. It's cute. So anyhow, here we are at Oxford University, and Bond is speaking in Danish, and he's here studying, quote-unquote. He's actually in bed in... I don't know where this room is at Oxford. It's clearly not residence. <laughs> it's like this big ornate living room with a bed in the middle of it. But anyhow, Bond is hot for teacher, as it turns out. He and his Danish teacher are making out, having just had sex. And Bond's phone starts ringing. It's Money Penny. Money Penny is there to tell him that he needs to come in to MI6. There's a new mission for him, and there are some innuendo lines in this scene. There are some good innuendo lines in this scene. <laughs> this actually, that's a hell of a one at the end. There are a few. There, there's like you know, Bond. What are you doing? Oh, I'm just brushing up on a little Danish. Yeah, studying a new tongue. Money Penny comments that Bond was always a cunning linguist. <laughs> And Bond is like, I'll be there in a half an hour. Uh, better make it an hour in typical Bond fashion. M Money Penny hangs up and turns around and M is right there. Having overheard her quip that he was always a cunning linguist, she sort of winces at M and says, don't ask. And M just says, don't tell. And the scene cuts away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can tell M has absolutely no interest in hearing the context for what Money Penny has just said. <laughs> Less than zero interest. So then we get a scene with Admiral Roebuck. I checked, he's an admiral. Admiral Roebuck and M and the unnamed Minister of Defense. This is the only time we will see this Minister of Defense, played by Julian Fellows, who is an actor and has acted in many things, but is best known probably as the writer and creator of Downton Abbey. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah. Neat. Yeah, does a lot of writing. That's probably his most famous thing sort of worldwide. Working on a screenplay for The Wind in the Willows. I will be very oh. interested to see to see that. Neat. This is a sort of a standard kind of tension scene between the Minister of Defense looking for advice from the military and special intelligence who are mm -hmm. not agreeing on what should be done here. The Navy is like, this was an unprovoked attack on British forces in international waters. We need to sail the entire Royal Navy up their wazoo. <laughs> as a show of force and m is like we don't know that it's not clear at all what happened here and i'd like to not escalate tensions to the point that we bring the world to an end until we have a chance to send one of our assets in to investigate and figure out what happened exactly because we haven't been able to find the ship M is like, things don't add up here, and we need to tread carefully before we rattle the saber too hard. The result of this conversation is that it will take them 48 hours to get all their ships in position anyhow, and they've sort of reached an impasse. The Minister of Defense is like, Jesus, I don't want to start World War III here, but, you know, we've got some tough decisions to make. Then Bond walks in with the newspaper that says their British sailors have been murdered and, and shows the machine gunning of them by China, and at that point, they're like, well, we're committed. The press is already screaming for blood. We we have no choice but to make a military show. So you've got 48 hours. To note, Carver's newspaper is named Tomorrow, and it's like an international newspaper. And that's like mm -hmm. the joke with the title, kind of, because the title is like sort of meaningless, like Tomorrow Never Dies. Yeah. So but they are immediately like, how does he have this information? We need to look into him. And so that we cut to the M office scene for this movie, which is taking place in a Daimler Chrysler absolutely hauling ass through London. <laughs> With police escort, yeah. Yeah, M and Robinson are in the back seat. Bond is in the facing seat. Money Penny is up in the front seat with the driver. It's, it's unfortunate because, like, you can just barely see it, but they all have drinks. <laughs> <laughs> like as if they were in M's office and mm -hmm. they changed it because the studio was like, that's weird and we don't like it. And so it's all the close shots because there's like I watched the deleted scenes and there's some shots with like <laughs> Bond trying to drink while they're like being really bumpy and just flooring it through London, tr yeah. trying to drink his martini or whatever. <laughs> you can just right. barely see M's bourbon in this thing. Anyway, it's kind of a funny detail. Yeah, nobody takes a sip of their drink. But, but Bond and M both have their glasses appear in frame over the course of this scene. Yeah. So M wants Bond to look into Elliot Carver because obviously he's super suspicious. And <laughs> she mentions that Bond had relations with his wife at some point. Bond is like, that's 
how do you know that? And then the window comes down and Money Penny's in the front seat and it comes up that Money Penny mentioned it. And he's like, oh, thanks. Great. Thanks for keeping that one quiet. And she's like, oh, you know, it's all for Queen and Country, James. Bond is quick to mention that the relations that happened were before she was married. Right. M is like, does not care at all. She's like, you you will use every asset at your disposal to get information. You will insinuate yourself with Carver's wife and pump her for information. And then Money Penny quips, you'll just have to decide how much pumping is necessary. Oh my God. Like, okay. <laughs> this, okay. M saying pump her for information is already like, way more of an innuendo than you need especially coming from judy dench <laughs> yes and i was <laughs> right i was like ha ha and then yeah money penny being like you'll just have to determine how much pumping is required or whatever it's just like yeah god then bond takes it to a third level oh right yeah no no he responds with if only that were true of you and i my darling it's like <laughs> i kind of imagine robinson just being like can i just like open the door and like <laughs> tuck and roll out of this conversation. I'll see you back at headquarters yeah. later. <laughs> like, I don't like, holy moly. Do I need to file an HR complaint? <laughs> oh, good grief. So at Hamburg airport, Bond picks up a copy of the brand new tomorrow, which says that China warns the British fleet and then goes up to the Avis car rental depot where there is a woman with the Avis uniform of the very bright red blazer and red tie. He says, I'm checking in. I'm, I have a car reserved. And she says, yes, yes. One second. I'll just go get it. And then Bond finds beside him a different Avis agent. <laughs> it's Q. <laughs> in his bright red Avis blazer. And he has the insurance papers for the car. He's like, I need you to sign here for the extended insurance. And then Bond, of course, ribs him. Will you need collision insurance? Oh, definitely. Fire? Probably. Personal injury? Uh, you know, I hope not, but things happen. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a fun little, fun little comedy scene, basically. I quite like this one. Yeah. And then we see the actual reveal of the car where a shipping crate opens up and there is a BMW inside. It's a very basic BMW. I'm not fond of this car. No, it was expensive, certainly, but it's not like a flashy vehicle. The trick is, and we'll find out later, that they wanted a four-door. They wanted something with a back seat. Right. You'll notice in the wide shot in the beginning of this that there's another crate open in the background. Yeah. Because there was originally a gag at the beginning of the scene where Q is like, here's your car and opens it. The thing collapses and there's, you can see there's a Jaguar, the animal in a cage. And Bond <laughs> is like, Jaguar? You know, haha, car joke. And then Q is like, whoops, wrong crate. And then they open this one. But it, they were like, this is, we don't need this. So they just left the crate of the, the cat prancing around in its crate in the background. No other shot to use. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, the car has all the usual bells and whistles with one notable addition, which ties in with the Sony Ericsson phone that Bond is being given. That also has a fingerprint scanner and a taser. And if you open it up, it has a trackpad in the middle of it for remote controlling the car. Right. Q tries to demonstrate and can't do it terrifically. And then Bond is like, well, here, let me have a shot. And just like does donuts around this airplane hangar. Before bringing it to a stop like millimeters from their knees. Yeah. In a really obvious force performance perspective shot but i kind of love it anyhow <laughs> yeah oh it also has a german robotic assistant that is used only to annoy us throughout the film <laughs> yeah because the next scene is bond arriving at carver media group's like big launch and he gets out and gives it to the valet and she says something and bond is like don't let her boss you around yeah and then it only ever comes up in one other scene later in the film and it's meant to be funny but it's mostly annoying mm -hmm. <laughs> so here we are at the Carver Media Group. I don't know what the N stands for. It's CMGN, but I only I only know what the Carver Media Group Network. Is it network? Yeah, because this is the launch of the the network. The Carver Media Group has existed and they do all the newspapers and everything and own all those uh, magazines. Of course. And then this is the launch day of Carver Media Group Network, the 24 hour news channel. Got it. We hear Carver telling a story about how, because this is 1997, so this is 
mad cow disease is very fresh right. in the collective memory of folks in the UK. I mean, you know, around the world, it was sort of like a, th- a whole thing. And he's talking about how now, of course, I absolutely didn't run the mad cow disease story because the head of the British beef board owed me 10,000 pounds from a bet. And I also definitely didn't keep it in the headlines for over a year because the French government paid me to. <laughs> definitely not. It's just like, this guy is not remotely concerned with keeping a low profile on how corrupt he is. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's this huge party. There's laser lights and everything. The I found the director's commentary fascinating because, of course, for all these scenes involving video screens, this is 1997, the video screens can only get so bright. The video screens are at maximum brightness, and so they have to reduce the rest of the light to dimmer than they would normally use on a movie set to make it all right. even, meaning that the cameras in scenes with video screens are shooting at like f2, 2.8, meaning that they have very shallow depth of field in all the scenes with video screens in them, which I thought was kind of interesting from a photography perspective. Right. Because this is me. Anyway, (laughs) Carver's assistant introduces him to the new, she just says, this is one of the new bankers or a new banker. I guess the implication is that this is someone working in Carver Media Group. It's completely unclear. (laughs) I don't actually understand the cover story here. She's like, here is the new banker, Mr. Bond. And it's like, why are you introducing this man to Elliot Carver? What cover? Carver story allows this. Here's Steve from accounting. For his point, Carver is also not interested in talking to this guy. (laughs) (laughs) So he immediately directs his attention to a new character. Yeah. Who appears. Wei Lin, played by Michelle Yeoh. Oh, Michelle Yeoh is so great. She shows up as a reporter for the New China News Agency. Carver immediately calls her on the fact that she was not on the guest list for this party. She confesses that she snuck in for the reason that she just wanted to meet him. And Carver, at this point, has forgotten Bond exists. (laughs) And compliments her on the fact that, you know, I, I, you know, I really like a woman who takes initiative and is now investing his time in talking to Michelle Yeoh, which gives Bond leave to just sort of walk off and start chatting up Carver's wife. We'll talk a little more about Michelle Yeoh later, but you mentioned Carver's wife, played by Terry Hatcher. Terry Hatcher. Which is interesting because Michelle Yeoh at the time in North America was not particularly well known at all. But at the time in North America, Terry Hatcher was practically a household name because of the TV series with Dean Cain, (laughs) Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman. Did you ever watch Lois and Clark? Sure did. Who didn't? My parents watched a lot of Lois and Clark. Yeah, I don't remember any of it. But I remember it existed. I remember it being pretty melodramatic. (laughs) I mean, okay, so I'm not going to impugn a Superman TV series for being melodramatic on the grounds that I unironically adore, adore CW's The Flash, (laughs) which is... A superhero soap opera, the likes of which no other superhero media could possibly hope to top. It is so earnest and so melodramatic that, you know what? If you're into Lois and Clark, fill your boots. I have no higher ground. I think the best part of Lois and Clark might have been Lane Smith as Perry White. (laughs) Because Perry White was great in that series. But yeah, like like the name of the show is a pun on like the explorers, Lewis and Clark. Like that's a weird place to start from. But yeah, it was a lighthearted romantic drama show, which is like, it's just a weird frame for Superman. And they're going back to that well. Yeah. I mean, now I'm steering away from James Bond, but of course there is a new Superman. Superman and Lois TV show in the works that is focused on their lives as parents of two kids. And it's going to be like a household, super human household drama. Wow. Starring the current Lois and Clark from the CW Arrowverse. Huh. But yeah, this was a, it was a super popular show. So like, and of course, Terry Hatcher since then has gone on to do a bunch of stuff, including most famously Desperate Housewives. Mm -hmm. She's actually in Supergirl also. Yes. Rhea, Ray. Yeah, I I think she and Dean Cain play Supergirl's adoptive parents in Supergirl, but it's been a while since I've watched Supergirl. That's kind of cute, even though Dean Cain sucks out loud. (laughs) Oh, yeah. 
But the Arrowverse has been really good about doing little cameos like that. So it, it's fun stuff. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, the end result is Terry Hatcher, very well known as a Bond co-star in this movie, which is sort of unusual. It would become less unusual, but I think one of the most like already famous at the time of being in the Bond film. Right. Yeah. Not launching a career off it. Yeah. So Bond does go to speak to Carver's wife while uh, Waylon is distracting Carver himself. And the meeting doesn't go super well. Bond walks up to her and, you know, introduces himself and she turns around and slaps him to the shock and amazement of the people standing around. Because, of course, they're not alone. She immediately is like, all right, now we're even. And they get back to chatting. Bond sort of starts to ask her about Carver. She's not super gunned on the idea of giving him information. She clearly knows Bond's history because she says at one point, you know, tell me, James, do you still sleep with a gun under your pillow? Which it turns out that Gupta is in another room surveilling the party over CCTV. And he is recording this conversation. And we'll find out in a few minutes. He ends up actually isolating the audio and reporting this to Carver. But Bond is trying to get some information from her and she's like, I've already made my choices in life. Her specific line is, I've made my bed and you don't sleep in it anymore. But the message she delivers to Bond is like, if you make me choose between you and my husband, I'm going to choose my husband. So you're barking up the wrong tree. I'm not going to betray him. And so Bond walks off. He's like, all right, well, this is going to be a dead end. We're not going to get anywhere here. And that is basically where they leave this scene off. They're interrupted by Carver and Wei Lin approaching them, being like, hey, what's up? Terry Hatcher's character, who I realize we failed to mention her name, is Paris. Bond says we're old friends, and she's like, acquaintances. Did she say that, like, he dated her roommate or something? Yes, like, that is her story. And she's very like, yep, here's this guy again. And Carver's like, ah, uh, OK, I buy that. Sure. There's a weird, really awkward interaction just before they leave where Carver's like, I wanted to introduce you to Wei Lin. I'm going to make her the head of my Beijing studio. And Terry Hatcher is like, ah, oh, that's great. I'm sure she won't resist too much. It's super weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I don't know, like, is the implication that Elliot Carver, like, sleeps around a lot or did at one point? I'm glad you mentioned that because I remember thinking at the time, what an unusual exchange. Yeah, I take the implication to be a little more innocent, where it's just like Elliot Carver gets what he wants no matter what. And so if he wants to make you the head of his Chinese branch, you become the head of his Chinese branch, whether that is in line with your career expectations or not. But it's still like this weird interaction between them. And I'm not totally clear on what characterization it's getting at between Carver and his wife. Because Paris has just gone to bat for Carver, telling Bond is like, you're not getting anything from me. He's my husband. I love him. We are in the past and I have no reason to help you. And then Carver walks over and they immediately have this sort of like stick daggers in each other. <laughs> like, it's so weird. Yeah, it's very, very odd. And then there's like a moment as they're then walking away that reminds me a lot of that moment in Thunderball where Largo and Domino are walking away and Largo's like, so what's up with that? And Domino is immediately just like oh he wants to know more information about you he asked when we'd be on the boat except in this case carver is like okay so but how do you really know him and she's like i told you that that's it he and i are not a thing yeah i barely know that guy and carver doesn't buy it right carver is a little unhinged because he goes right from that to asking stamper to beat bond up and boy does he <laughs> The party continues. Bond is chatting with Wei Lin and some goons come over and tell Bond, Mr. Bond, you have an urgent phone call. <laughs> and Bond is like, oh, do I? And proceeds to follow them. This occurred to me as a scene that feels dated. Everybody has a cell phone nowadays. He has a cell phone. Well, I mean, yeah, but it, we wouldn't necessarily expect that everybody has a cell phone in 1997. So the idea that at a party, somebody might be like, oh, there's an urgent phone call for you. It's like, I need to get a hold of James Bond. I know he's at this party, but I don't know his cell phone number. Yeah. And so you call the party. But nowadays it's like, what do goons say to people they want to take into a back room and, and give what for? That's a good question. Sorry, you have an urgent phone call. No, I don't. I can see it right here. Uh, <laughs> so anyhow, Bond follows them into the back room where they proceed to work him over from top to bottom. Specifically, they take him into a recording studio. 
meaning that none of the sound can get out, including into the next room where there's someone sort of like watching, but he's not really paying attention to Bond because the scene cuts back and forth between the shots of Bond getting worked over in this soundproof room and Elliot Carver delivering that speech you were talking about earlier, where he's like, I want the power to broadcast all my news, and then I will dominate the world in news reporting. (laughs) So anyhow, Bond survives the beating. He he eventually decides, if it were me, I would simply not get attacked, and then just like (laughs) flips a switch and starts attacking all three of these goons. Yeah, he grabs like a microphone stand and starts beating one of the guys at the microphone stand. And then he has this perfectly good microphone stand in his hand as one of the other guys that he's beaten up is like leaning on the desk, like holding his head. And instead of hitting him with the microphone stand again, he puts the microphone stand down, finds this glass ashtray, tests it for weight in his hand, walks over and shatters the thing over the back of the guy's head. (laughs) I did think that was an odd choice. In the course of this fight, they all got thrown through the window into the recording studio where the guy is watching and like producing Carver's speech. And so Bond starts flipping switches and he kills the power to the speech. And of course, Carver was broadcasting his speech to like television and their broadcast gets cut, which causes Carver to go off the wall. He is not at all impressed. His assistant, who has been helping all along and was like just off stage to the side, walks up and immediately is like, we've had a power outage. Power is down. We're no longer broadcasting. Carver's like, what happened? And she's like, I don't know. And he immediately is like, you're fired. (laughs) Get out of my sight. She starts telling people, you know, like, there's no need to panic. We've just had a power outage. You don't need to leave. Please just wait. We'll get the power back up in a minute. Bond uses this chaos to escape and we cut to Bond in his hotel room waiting to see who's going to come for him next. And it's actually like a pretty strong visual callback to Dr. No. Oh, right. Because he's sitting there putting the silencer on his gun and he's just like taking slugs of straight vodka. Yeah, like he's sitting in a chair facing the door with a little side table with a shot glass and a bottle of vodka. And he takes his PPK, puts the silencer on it and then puts it down on the table. And then every time he hears a sound, he like picks it up and points it at the door while like still in his tuxedo pants and shirt, but with like no tie or jacket on. Like, I I don't know. It, It strikes me as visual reference. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. While he's waiting, we cut back to Carver. The party's now gone. Everyone's left the building. And he and Paris are watching a different news channel with a guy going like, oh, and apparently Elliot Carver trying to launch his new news network encountered a little bit of a technical difficulty earlier today. Uh, All I can say is, wasn't us, Elliot. And he hates that he's getting, you know, mocked by other news. This hecked me up because the actor playing the news anchor is Jeff Harding, who has had a whole bunch of little roles here and there over the years, a bunch of stuff in the UK. He's American, but he works primarily in the UK. Apparently, he's best known actually for like reading audiobooks, but he appears in this ongoing role in a British sketch comedy show called The Fast Show. That was very formative for Paul and myself, where he plays the character of like an on location reporter named Ed Winchester. And all he does is be in different locations and go, hi, I'm Ed Winchester. And then stands there and smiles. (laughs) That's all he does. But he does it in this like really like dopey way, like he's doing here where he's like, it wasn't us, Elliot. And I was just like, holy crap, it's Ed Winchester. (laughs) He's moved up to the news desk. It's just it's weird when like your frame of reference for an actor in a not comedy thing is primarily in comedy. Right. Okay. brief aside, Mark Williams is an actor. He plays the the elder Weasley in the Harry Potter movies like Ron's dad. Right. Right. Yeah. He was also in the fast show and he had a character in the show where basically he would make some sort of massive social faux pas and everyone in the room would stop what they were doing and stare at him. And then he would just go. I'll get me coat and then get up and leave. (laughs) Just like, I'll see myself out is basically what he was doing. Right. Yeah. And I can't remember exactly which movie it was. I think it was like one of the last Harry Potter movies where it's like Harry and Ginny in the Weasley's place. Mm -hmm. 
and it's like looking like something might happen and then he like bumbles into the room and sits down and is like becomes aware that he has interrupted something between them and i was just waiting for him to to say i'll get me coat and i am positive there's an outtake out there somewhere where he does it because i'm just like this is the setup (laughs) say the thing (laughs) say the line Uh, wow Anyway, seeing Ed Winchester dunk on Elliot Carver was very surprising to me. Right. So Carver's mad. Paris tries to calm him down by basically doing the like, hey, come on, things happen. And he's like, not to me. Even she's taken aback by how mad he is. I don't know how they got to this point in their relationship without her realizing that she's married to a madman. Yeah. Anyhow, we then cut back to Bond's hotel room and she walks in. Because he said at the end of that exchange, he basically makes it clear that he's sending her to figure out what's going on with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he says, "Uh, your friend Bond, I want to know everything about him. And she's like, I barely know him. And he says, barely? And then there's a like sinister kiss between them. And then it cuts to the hotel room. When the door opens in his hotel room, Bond reaches for the gun. And then when he sees that it's Paris is like, wasn't reaching for the gun. (laughs) Because he wasn't expecting it to be her. This scene is sort of Bond having to deal with one of the many women whom he slept with and then peaced out on. I actually think this aspect of his character development in this film kind of works. Yeah. Like up to this point and up to the point at which Paris exits the film, they do a pretty good job of exploring that aspect of his personality and their relationship and the like the impact of it. Mm -hmm. I sort of complained a little bit about how I didn't think some of the emotional beats of Bond's character worked in Goldmine. And I think they are doing a better version of that here by actually having his past catch up with him than they were doing in the last one by just having people tell him that his past was going to catch up with him. Yeah. Even though that whole movie is about his past catching up with him, but in a different way. (laughs) Yeah, true. (laughs) I guess maybe it's a little weird that she's like, I'm I'm annoyed that you left we should talk about that and he's like i guess but instead let's have sex and she's like yeah that yeah good call and, you know like they don't <laughs> deal with it like it doesn't it doesn't get dealt with actually i mean it, it is es- yeah. essentially left unresolved because paris is gonna die soon in this movie which she seems to know she seems to be pretty clear on that being what's gonna happen Yeah, I mean, like, as soon as she walks into the room, it's relatively evident that she is no longer on Carver's side. Like, that switch flipped (laughs) Yeah, in the extremely sinister meeting that she had with her husband. So she comes into this room, and, like, they both still clearly have feelings for each other, even though she had sort of been covering them. She's playing this scene sort of like she's seducing him. She's at least playing it to Bond, sort of like she's betraying her husband. But it's not super clear that that's what she's doing. But Bond is like, sure, let's go with it. I have unresolved feelings, so let's unresolve them some more. (laughs) He does try to, like, send her home, and she's like, no, that's not what I'm here for. Yeah. We cut away from what she's here for to see Carver talking to Henry Gupta. Now, Henry Gupta was originally supposed to be an Indian actor. But they went a different direction with casting and kept the name. Hmm. So this guy's name is Gupta. And this guy is Ricky J. That also messed me up. I was like, holy crap, is that Ricky J? Because the <laughs> thing is, he's done a fair chunk of acting, but I know him more as a magician. Like, there was never a better card manipulator than Ricky J. Like, he has done huh. some phenomenal card illusions, card manipulations, card throwing. They actually tried to work his card throwing into the movie as like a thing that the henchman does and they shot a bunch of it, but it turns out that it does not look exciting on camera, (laughs) Mm. which is a real shame. But like Gupta's thing was supposed to be that he like throws playing cards. And yeah, Ricky Jay was in The Prestige, for example. Okay. He had a semi-recurring role in Deadwood as Eddie Sawyer. He was in Boogie Nights. He was in Mystery Men. Uh, Magnolia like he's been in a fair chunk of notable movies but I always think of him primarily as a stage magician (laughs) right so it was just kind of weird 
that he's just kind of this guy. It's a shame that they couldn't make the cards thing work because he doesn't really have a lot going on to his character otherwise. Yeah, he's just Carver's IT guy. Basically, yeah. And he's showing Carver that he's checked in on Mr. Bond. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I checked in. I looked at where he said he worked. And yeah, here's his employment record. He works there. He is perfect. He's a model employee. He's never missed a day. So this is fake. And Carver's like, what? What do you mean? He's like, no one, no one's this perfect. No one has such an unblemished record. Like he's worked there for 10 years. He's never screwed up or missed anything. Like this is fake. Also, and then this is where he plays the isolated audio of Paris asking him, so do you still sleep with a gun under your pillow? And Carver looks very, very mad and says that I think Paris needs to have a meeting with the doctor which is menacing. <laughs> yeah. Strictly speaking, that exchange is not evidence that her cover story was untrue. Yeah. Perhaps she and her roommate talked about Bond's predilection for having a gun under his pillow. Look, he's a weird guy. That's why I didn't <laughs> hang out with him since. Rewind. Notice I slapped him. Like, I don't like this guy. Yeah. He keeps a gun under his pillow. What a weirdo. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the morning and Paris is getting dressed and she tells Bond that there's a hatch on the roof of the printing building that Bond could use to sneak in. And Bond's like, you don't need to tell me this. And she says, no, well, I do. I am. I know what I'm doing. And Bond offers to like, I can get you out of the country in four hours. <laughs> like, let me protect you. And she's like, there's nobody on earth that can protect me. You just have to get him. And then by way of time passing, we get a shot of Carver sitting in his massive empty. The fact that his rooms are always empty, <laughs> <laughs> that there's nobody running this network is so odd. But yeah, he's sitting in this massive room with no news playing on any of the monitors, just sort of sitting in a spotlight contemplating something. And then we cut to the printing press, the massive newspaper factory floor for tomorrow. I quite like this detail that because it's printed internationally that there's signage for like Domain and Morgan and, you know, the word tomorrow in a bunch of different languages. Right. Some of this is the IBM offices near London Airport. Okay. So that kind of tracks. Bond's cell phone also has a lockpick in the antenna, which Q didn't mention at the time, and or he did, and it was very brief. I'm not entirely sure. I didn't think he mentioned it either. But Bond uses this hatch to come down from the roof into a room with like a it's like a satellite in it. And anyway, Gupta's there with some cronies, and he's like, all right, we're going to take this satellite and ship it out to whatever. And then they leave the room, and Bond uses the taser on his phone to sneak in to Gupta's office. So, A, they have this satellite just like leaned up against the stairs on the side of the room. <laughs> and Gupta's like, all right, we're going to take this to the launch facility. Be real careful with it. It's worth $30 million. You break it, you buy it. <laughs> What odds do you give that this satellite is going to survive this scene? Absolutely none. <laughs> and you would be right. So Bond starts rooting around Gupta's room. And I like this very simple visual storytelling of how long he's been in there. Because there's just a couple montage shots of him like searching through stuff. And then it cuts to a close up shot of him. What is obviously swiveling in an office chair, mm -hmm. which is like, to me, that is a terrific visual shorthand for time has passed. He's gotten bored and can't figure out what to do. So he's sat down and is idly swiveling an office chair. And then he realizes, wait a minute. I don't know why I didn't think of this sooner. There probably is safe behind that picture. So he goes and yes, there's a safe behind the picture and he uses the fingerprint scanner on his phone mm -hmm. to scan Gupta's fingerprint, which then shows the fingerprint on the screen. So then he puts the screen mm -hmm. of the phone up to the fingerprint scanner and that all works. It's by magic. In the safe is a pile of money, a bag of cocaine, a stack of porno mags <laughs> and the GPS interference device which Bond takes and then leaves. And before he is all the way out, he hears someone unlocking the door. So he runs over to the door, holds his gun up, and who should come through the door but Wei Lin, who unfortunately has also just set off an alarm. So now we get action chase. And this is a pretty good action chase. It is. It's fun because nobody knows Wei Lin is there. They think Bond is responsible for all this. So Bond is like drawing all the attention of all the guards and like all the gunfire as Wei Lin is like using her spy gadgets to escape undetected and like waving at Bond along the way. But Bond makes his escape. He gets shot at a lot. He runs around the building. It's a it's an action chase. 
It's a pretty fun one. There's a bit where Waylin walks down the wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Waylin walks down a wall as Bond is being chased around the room by goons. He ultimately goes down into the printing press and gets in a fight with a goon on a catwalk over the printing press. It's another one of those like good James Bond deaths where Bond like wings the guy over the rails of the catwalk and into the printing press. Like he falls through the paper that's running across the printing press. And then we get this shot of the paper still being printed, but now with this red smear across it. And then it cuts back to Bond where he quips, oh, they'll print anything these days. (laughs) So he ultimately makes his way out. He gets out to the street, runs across the street, gets in his car and drives away. Interesting note about the car ride here, because he gets a phone call from Carver. How Carver knows his number is beyond me. (laughs) But he gets a phone call from Carver who says something to indicate that Paris is dead and that Bond is about to be framed for it or something. He says that Paris is in his hotel room, which is obviously weird because he saw her leave in the morning. And if Carver knows that Paris is in Bond's hotel room, she's probably there dead. But in the scene, Bond's holding the phone up to his face the whole time because during one of the fight scenes, Brosnan was injured by a stuntman's helmet and ended up with a cut above his upper lip on his right side that required like eight stitches. Oh, wow. And so they had to rearrange how they were shooting certain things to obscure that because they couldn't put makeup on it or else it would take even longer to heal. Right. And so in this scene, he's got his phone up there to cover that. But at the very, very end of the sequence, just as he's putting the phone down, you can see just like a frame of the slice on his upper lip. Oh, wow. Yeah. So he barrels back to the hotel. Yes. Across the road, Stamper is standing on a roof and he sort of radios in to someone is just sort of like he's here. And Bond parks the car, puts the GPS thing in the glove box, takes his gun out of the glove box and locks the car and sort of notices as he's heading inside that a couple Mercedes cars and a tow truck are heading into the underground parkade. So he walks back to his room and the door is open. We get a shot through the ajar door down the hallway as Bond is walking up the hallway. He notices this. He draws his gun, comes into the room, and the room is empty as far as he can see, except that there is a newscast playing on the television talking about the death of Paris Carver. As he walks in, he spots Paris lying dead on the bed. He walks over to the bed, understandably upset about the fact that she's dead. He checks her pulse to see if she's dead or not. She is. And the news report in the background says that she had been found dead with an as yet unidentified man who appeared to have killed himself in an act of suicide. Bond realizes that something's up and lo and behold, there's another man in the room with a gun trained on Bond's back. This is the doctor, and I kind of love him. (laughs) Like, his characterization is very good, and he's just played really well. So he's like, all right, please sit down on the bed. I'm going to make this look like you killed yourself. And Bond, like, he goes and sits down in a chair, and Bond starts analyzing the situation, and he's like, you won't be able to make it look like a suicide if you shoot me from there. And he's like, please, I have a PhD in forensic medicine. I could shoot you from Stuttgart and still make it look the way I want it to look. Bond is like, oh, geez. As this is going, the men who are outside trying to break into Bond's car encounter some problems. They they walk up to the car. They try to open it. It electrocutes them. So then they're like, all right, go get the sledgehammers. And they grab the sledgehammers and they start beating on the windows of the car with sledgehammers and the sledgehammers just stop dead and the windows don't get damaged at all. They take a gun and shoot at the door and the bullets all just ricochet off the door, leaving a few little dents, but not really damaging the car at all. And so they call in to Stamper, who then like calls into the doctor saying that we need you to get information. The men can't get into the car to get the GPS device. So the doctor then is like, this is very embarrassing. It's extremely unprofessional. I'm quite sorry, (laughs) but I need you to tell our men how to get into your car. And Bond is like, are you going to torture me? 
is this also part of your profession? He's like, no, this is more like a hobby, <laughs> but I can be quite persuasive. <laughs> so, okay, the weird thing about this scene, first of all, the Dr. Kaufman here, played by Vincent Schiavelli, who is just like, you've seen him in something. There's too many things to name, but you've seen this guy somewhere. And this scene is so odd because like Bond is having to play this scene very seriously because Paris is lying dead on the bed and he knows that it's directly because of his involvement. But this is fundamentally a comedy scene. And I do think Pierce Brosnan handles it very well, but like this is a goofy scene <laughs> with a not goofy thing having happened in it. Yeah, it all comes down to Dr. Kaufman, right? It is a goofy character in an otherwise very serious scene and situation. Because, like, the actual events of the scene aren't really goofy either, because he has killed Paris, and he's here to kill Bond, and decides that he needs to get information from Bond because they can't do anything without him. And so he threatens him, and is like, I'm going to torture you until you give us the information, and then I'm going to kill you. But you can make this all easier on everybody if you just give me the information. But Dr. Kaufman's just such a, like, a goofy character. The way he's being played is so quirky. <laughs> I quite like this scene, but it has the potential to be really totally imbalanced, and I don't think it is. I think it plays as a little bit of comic relief, but in a way that just keeps the scene from feeling too dire. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's impressive, honestly, to all involved that it doesn't yeah. <laughs> feel so tonally weird, because you're right, it really should... <laughs> Yeah, this is a, a scene that is walking a fine line between like a total tonal train wreck and what it is and what it is is really good. Mm -hmm. The way Bond gets out of this is that Dr. Kaufman asks, like, could you tell us how to get into the car? And Bond says, well, it's controlled by my cell phone. Here it is. He hands him his cell phone and is like, what you need to do is you need to press recall three and the doors will unlock. And and he goes to do it. And Kaufman is like, no, no, I think I'll do it. Give me the phone. So he hands him the phone. He presses the buttons. Those buttons trigger the taser device in the phone, tasering Dr. Kaufman as Bond leaps off the bed, grabs his gun arm and turns it around to shoot Kaufman. And Kaufman says, please, Mr. Bond, I'm just a professional doing a job. And Bond, like completely cold, just says, so am I and pulls the trigger. Mm hmm validating the news report <laughs> because now there is in fact a man dead in an apparent suicide in the room bond having now escaped from the room heads down to the car park but he does so not by going through the hotel but by escaping to the roof of the hotel which stamper then sees stamper spots him leaving the hotel room and he heads into the parkade and sees all these guys gathered around the car. So in order to escape, he initiates a car chase with a remote controlled car. He hides off in the corner and triggers the tear gas around the car to incapacitate all the guys and then drives it away and dives through the window as it drives past him into the back seat of the car. And this is, I assume, why they wanted a you know a four door with a back seat. And we get this chase scene through a parkade where Bond takes advantage of all of the various accoutrements of his mi6 issue car as he is driving it via remote control from the back seat now i noticed something almost immediately in this scene which was the music because i had noticed a tiny note earlier in the scene where he's running through the printing press building that put me in mind of the theme to ohmss mm -hmm. and then in this scene I was like, the score for this scene has breakbeats. And not just any breakbeats, this sounds exactly like the beats that the propeller heads used in their remix of OHMSS. Right. So that remix, which was released on the propeller heads only album, 1998's Dex and Drums and Rock and Roll, which came out, of course, after this movie was originally released on an album called Shaken and Stirred, the David Arnold James Bond Project, which was an album of cover versions of James Bond themes, mm -hmm. which was organized by David Arnold, the composer for this movie. 
So he had already been working with the propeller heads before this movie came out and everything was in such a rush. So this scene is scored by the propeller heads. This is a song by the propeller heads called Backseat Driver hmm. that they made for this movie, which is why it sounds like a propeller heads track, because it's by them and it just uses the same break beats that they use in like this and Spy Break. <laughs> also, I want to hear the rest of this album now. Yeah. Because it's like Iggy Pop doing a cover of We Have All the Time in the World. Pulp doing a cover of All Time High. Huh. I kind of want to hear this whole album now. Yeah, I'd never heard of it before now. No, me neither. Yeah, I, I was actually thrown because the menu music for the Blu-ray for this movie. Yeah, is it's the Moby remix. Yeah, which I, I actually thought was written for The World Is Not Enough. Uh, no, it was made for this movie. No. Oh. It originally appeared on an album of movie music that Moby had done for films called I Like to Score. Right. But that came out October 97 and then the official soundtrack came out like November 97. So like it was all happening all at the same time, basically. Right. And it charted pretty high as well in the UK. But yeah, it was actually for this movie, even though I don't think it appears in the movie. I didn't notice it. I was listening out for it and I didn't notice it in the movie and I didn't see it in the end credits. So I don't think it's actually in the movie. But normally the Blu-ray menus do some notable music from the movie itself. Often the theme song, but not always. Sometimes sort of like a very catchy part of the sub theme. Right. If there's like a second sort of instrumental theme. And yeah, for this one, it's the Moby remix. And I was like, that's weird. Is that in this movie? And then watched it and it wasn't. So Anyhow, we have this chase scene through this car park with Bond driving his car in the back seat. We're not going to do a play by play of this, but some fun highlights include the hood ornament of the car having a little saw blade in it so that when the bad guys raise a cable across one of the ramps, he cuts through the cable with this little saw blade is very purpose specific saw blade. So silly. I, I wonder how they knew this was going to happen. Another highlight of this scene is the windows in the front and back of Bond's car get shot up. And as he's driving down one corridor of this parkade, there's a guy at the other end with a bazooka <laughs> and he fires the bazooka at the car. But instead of firing the bazooka at like the hood of the car, he fires it at the front windshield of the car and it proceeds to fly right through the hole in Bond's front and rear windshield out the back of Bond's car and blows up the car that's in pursuit. Then the final highlight and the ultimate escape from this scene is Bond takes the car up to the roof, points it at a wall, hits go, and dives out of the car at the last second as the in-car computer says, warning, unsafe driving will void warranty. And the car goes through the wall, flies across the street, down to street level, before crashing through the plate glass window in an Avis car rental return center. What a profoundly irresponsible thing for James Bond of all people to do. <laughs> right? What about the poor employees? <laughs> what about the pedestrians that luckily happened to get out of the way? I mean, it's a cute joke. Oh, it is. <laughs> as long as you don't think about it too long. No, I do like returning the car to the Avis. Yeah. Which I had forgotten about initially. I was like, why is it crashing through what's obviously an Avis? Oh, right. This is technically an Avis rental in heavy air quotes. Yeah. I think the thing that sells it best is James Bond himself realizing how perfect this is as the car is midair. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's, he just has this expression. He's looking at the phone and the car is like sailing through the sky and the camera on the front of the car like arcs down towards the Avis. And he just puts one hand up as if to be like chef's kiss <laughs> as the car smashes through the front window. It's played very well. I mean, I think the best part of this whole scene is how much fun Bond is having with it. Like, there's so many shots of him flailing around the back seat of the thing, but a couple of the shots through the window where, like, something fun happens and he just laughs. He's just like, ah, ha, ha. It's just like, <laughs> I, I think that really helps sell it. Yeah. And something I really appreciate, again, from the director's commentary, because it's something that we've talked about before, or at least that I've banged on about before, is he talks about how important consistency and geography is for an action scene. Mm. That if you can't tell where things are 
There's no tension. Right. And I think back to the car chase in Never Say Never Again, where it's not clear to me what was happening. Whereas this, I have a great sort of sense of where everyone is in relation to one another. Right. Yeah. Right. And also there's like the moment where he drops Caltrops and takes a car out and then can't get out. So has to turn around and go drive back across his own Caltrops. And it's like, this all sort of meshes yeah it's very good like the structure of the scene is he's like several floors up in this parkade and he drives down to the front door trying to evade pursuers along the way and when he gets there they have dropped a grate in front of the door so he can't get out so then has to turn around and drive all the way back up to the top of the parkade which is where he launches it off into the street yeah and you can follow that perfectly like he's going down until he has to turn around and then he's going up until he escapes and each level of the parkade is color coded with the different numbers of the level of the parkade that he's on which is impressive because they only actually used one level of parkade oh really yeah (laughs) they just repainted it every time yeah (laughs) that's great all right so that ends that scene and we cut to the next scene which is a u.s air base in the south china sea which is okinawa i don't know why they didn't say okinawa but like u.s air base in south china sea means okinawa (laughs) Well, it's a U.S. airbase in the South China Sea. (laughs) Well, they shot it in England, so I guess it doesn't matter. (laughs) And Bond is dropped off by helicopter and is greeted by none other than Jack Wade. Yo, Jimbo. Yep. Ah, Joe Don Baker there in his Hawaiian shirt with like dinosaurs on it, I think, (laughs) or something. Yeah, it is a dinosaur themed shirt. You're right. I love it. It's so good. He greets Bond and gives him the, the rundown. He's like, so, you know, officially the U.S. is extremely neutral. We have no desire to see World War Three unless we start it. So we we're not taking sides, but unofficially we got your back. And so what the purpose of the scene is, is Bond now has the GPS decoder. And so he shows up at this airbase and is greeted by a military staffer who knows about this device. He confirms that the device they have is their lost GPS decoder. Bond asks, would it be possible to send a ship off course? by tampering with this and uh, the guy is like you mean like the devonshire and jack wade is like hey 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 hey! nobody said anything about the devonshire answer the man's question <laughs> and it was like well yeah i guess so and so bond is like can you have a look at this and lo and behold it turns out that it has been tampered with and anyone using gps coordinates provided by the tampered gps device would be offset by x number of miles the number of miles that they are offset by corresponds, or they will find out, corresponds to the amount that the Devonshire was offset by when it was sunk. So the piece comes together that the Devonshire was directed off course into Chinese territorial waters by the manipulation of this device and Gupta sending the incorrect coordinates to the Devonshire. Bond is like, all right, well, we know where the Devonshire was and we know what these coordinates would have told the Devonshire it was. So we need to go find the Devonshire. And so we cut to a military aircraft flying over the South China Sea where Bond is about to engage in a halo jump. Yeah, a halo jump, which stands for high altitude, low opening, because you jump from very, very high up so no one knows you're coming and you don't open your chute until you're very, very low so no one sees it on radar. And it's it's scary. Yeah, they're quite dangerous. A halo jump was the centerpiece of the most recent Mission Impossible movie, mostly because I think they actually sent Tom Cruise through it, you know, like the Mission Impossible movies do. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, in that one, that was Tom Cruise actually doing it himself. In this one, it was longtime James Bond stuntman B.J. Worth, who had to make 80 halo jumps. Holy. Because <laughs> uh, part of the problem was that he has these like air tanks, these like prop tanks on his back, which meant that there was more air resistance. So the camera jumper kept falling faster than he was. So to get footage of him in the air, they just had to do lots of different jumps. And they had like a second of just like, yeah, as they passed by one another. (laughs) One of the things that I find quite disappointing about this scene is the way it's cut together. It doesn't feel like they needed to do a halo jump at all. (laughs) (laughs) like just throw a guy out of an airplane and film him for the three seconds that he's in frame and then cut to the next one and then cut to the next like there there's no indication that the stunt that they're doing here is actually what they're claiming it is right yeah it's just a guy in halo gear that we see three or four shots of and then he opens his chute just before hitting (laughs) yeah the stunt actually sort of undercuts itself just 
by how it's shot and edited together. There's a couple really cool stunts in this movie that I think are actually sadly undercut by the editing, and this is definitely one of them. But he does land. He does. And one thing we learned just before he leaps out of the plane is that where he's going to land is actually not Chinese waters, but Vietnamese waters. That causes the various American personnel on the plane to freak out because they are like, oh, if the Vietnamese find him, they're going to lose their minds. How many American flags does he have on him? And they're just counting down. He's like, well, the tanks, the parachute, the wetsuit. (laughs) And as they're doing this, Bond leaps out of the plane. Yeah. So Bond lands. He opens his chute, drops into the water. Uh, One of my favorite things about this transition is that while he is falling, his two air tanks are like by his shoulder, like way out by the sides, because of course he has a parachute on. Mm -hmm. And when he's underwater, the equipment that he's wearing has clearly changed into a standard scuba apparatus because the tanks just materialize where the parachute had been. And the parachute pack is not there anymore. But it all changes under the disguise of a bunch of bubbles. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They hide the transition very well, but he's clearly wearing different equipment in the rest of the scene. Yeah. <laughs> so he swims aboard the wreck of the Devonshire, and it's very evocative of the similar scene in For Your Eyes Only, in that it's a sunken ship full of bodies, and Bond swims around and realizes that one of the missiles is missing. I don't know if we actually mentioned that. No, we didn't. That when they sank the Devonshire at the beginning of the movie, they stole one of the missiles. It's not nuclear, but it is definitely British, is the point. Yes. And speaking of the point, Bond is surprised by the point of a harpoon gun because guess who else is on the boat at the same time he is? <laughs> it's Wei Lin, whom he recognizes. They have a brief moment of like looking like they're not sure if they're going to have to kill each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then decide like, no, actually... This ship is on unstable ground. Let's at least get to the surface (laughs) before we fight. Yeah. And so they do, but not without some trouble. The ship that they're on is on unstable ground and the ground is giving way underneath them, causing the ship to list. And while they're aboard, discovering that the missile is missing, the ship lists enough that causes all the missile racks to topple over and they topple over like a series of dominoes until they close the bulkhead door that they entered through, trapping them in this room. They make a few efforts to try and move the missile racks, but they're too heavy. So they realize that their only way out is through a ventilation shaft. And in order to get out, they have to strip off their scuba tanks and go up this ventilation shaft and then swim to the surface. They do that and they escape. Very claustrophobic. Do not like it. I was watching the scene and I was like, okay, you can't fit into the shaft with the scuba tank on your back, but what if you took the scuba tank backpack off and just held it in front of you? I'm glad you and I both thought of the same thing. Yeah. (laughs) But anyhow, it makes for a good scene. So they get to the surface and Waylon's compatriot is there on a fishing vessel. He gives sort of a weird look to them because like two of them have surfaced and he was only expecting one and then gets shot by a harpoon gun and hauled over the side of the boat as it turns out that Stamper has taken control of the fishing boat along with a bunch of goons. And so then we are on a helicopter flying towards what I assume is one of the places that you thought might have benefited from a subtitle. Yes. Yeah. So it's Saigon and specifically the Carver Media Group network building in Saigon with an enormous banner of Carver's face. And another one of my favorite quips from Bond upon seeing this giant building looming over the entire skyline with this enormous poster of Carver on the front. He says, if I didn't know better, I'd say that Carver has an edifice complex. Wow. (laughs) I missed that. Edifice, of course. Yes. It's funny. There's actually a surprising amount of CG in this movie, more than you would expect, because it's very smartly used very sparingly and carefully. And one example is this building. This building exists, but it's not that tall. That's not what the top of the building looks like. Mm. So the building has been digitally extended and had the massive banner put on it. And it's not obvious. It doesn't look bad. Like, honestly, I'm watching it right now at 1080 and it absolutely holds up. So yeah, there's a lot of CG in the movie, but they use it very smartly. I'm not going to like break down every single shot, obviously, because I haven't been. But if you don't notice it, they've done a good job. Yeah. As they enter the building, they pass General Chang, who we know is General Chang because Wai Lin says it's General Chang. 
He's a general from China. And now we're in Carver's Saigon office, and Carver is there drafting the obituary for Commander James Bond. Also, worth mentioning that Bond and Waylin are handcuffed together. Yes. That will be relevant for the incoming action sequence. Yes. Carver's trying to get the wording right. He's clearly not typing. <laughs> Is a little wireless keyboard that he's just jamming his fingers on, but he, he's just, he can't quite get it right. You know, he's like, ah, oh, this lacks some punch. What do you think? Bond tries to get into Carver's head. This is something Bond does often, extending his own life by making it seem like he knows more than the bad guy thinks he knows. So he's like, oh, we've actually, Wei Lin and I, but we've been working together for months. And Wei Lin picks up on this immediately and is like, oh yeah, both our governments know everything that you and General Chang are up to. And Carver's like, I don't think you are. I, You might have seen General Chang in the hallway just now, but I, I'm pretty sure that you have no idea what's going on. <laughs> but we'll find out what you know, because Stamper is going to torture you. But first he shows off a couple incoming headlines including The Empire Will Strike Back, which he says he's very proud of, even though he didn't write that one, because he's really, really wants this war to go. Bond at one point just goes, wow, you are actually insane, aren't you, Carver? And Carver responds that the distance between insanity and genius is measured by success, which is the sort of thing an insane person would say. <laughs> so he has to go and set up whatever shenanigans he's doing with General Chang, and is leaving Bond and Wei Lin in the capable hands of Mr. Stamper and his toys, which is a comical looking set of torture instruments, which he learned from Dr. Kaufman. So Stamper is really upset at Bond for killing his teacher. <laughs> so they make some threatening gestures with these ridiculous looking pokey devices. What well, little articulated hook device that he's playing with. Yeah. I like that after Bond taunts Carver before he leaves, he's like, save this one till last. Yeah. And then it's like, when you remove Mr. Bond's heart, he should stay alive just long enough to see it stop beating. It's very grim, but over the top. So it's funny. Mm -hmm. Bond grabs a gun from one of the goons, shoots out the window, and he and Waylin jump out of the window. And this is very, very high up on the building, but there's a sort of a, like a mezzanine level. And they hide out there where the enormous banner of Carver's face is tethered. And so they grab a tool kit, like a, just someone's toolbox from doing work on the roof in which is a cleaver. It's, it's a little awkwardly edited to tell exactly what's going on. Yeah. But they wrap their arms around the ropes and cut the ropes from the building. It's really unclear that this is what's happening. Right. And then they leap off the building. And this is actually like a reference to like a Douglas Fairbanks pirate movie. But they leap off the building and the resistance from the banner being torn slows their fall. So they fall all the way down the front of the building until there's like a sliver of banner that they're hanging at the end from that is itself hanging from the bottom of the rest of the banner. So they're like 20 stories or something down from where they just were, but they're still not at the bottom of the building. Right. This is the other stunt that I think is really marred by the editing because like they did this, they built like a chunk of the <laughs> face of this building, like seven or eight stories of it and did a bunch of this for real, and then were able to do close-ups with the actual actors. And it's just such frenetic editing that I found it really disorienting. Yeah. Like, I don't know. This would have been another one of those ones that, frankly, if they'd been able to do it in one single wide shot, where you just watch these two people fall off the side of a building tearing a strip out of this banner, that would have sold the stunt. It's the salesmanship of the stunt, right? Like, I want to see that they have done the thing... <laughs> <laughs> not the cutting together of six one second glimpses of a part of the thing yeah and like granted that would have made it probably impractical to do in this context but there's those opportunities to just be like here's a ridiculous thing that we're about to do just sit here and watch it i like scenes like that in any movie and so i i would have appreciated it if they'd taken the opportunity to do that kind of thing here same yeah so they're now hanging from the bottom of the banner. And as you said, they're not close to the ground yet. Like there's still many stories above the ground. So they, they swing back and smash through a window onto a floor of the office 
where a bunch of office workers look on shocked and they make their escape down to the ground floor where they find a bunch of motorcycles. And at this point, we have the the requisite like Bond and his compatriot female intelligence officer both are trying to work their case themselves, but are now stuck working together, but both think they have the better way to do it. And so they come out the door. And Waylon wants to steal a car and Bond wants to steal a motorbike. They both are fighting with each other and then they go over to a motorbike and they go to get on the motorbike. And of course, they're handcuffed together. So they both try to get on and drive. <laughs> Bond sort of moves Waylon out of the way and takes the wheel of the motorbike. And she sort of like tries to fit herself on the back, but she can't sit forward on the back because her right arm is handcuffed to bond's left arm so she sits sort of like side saddle so that their arms can stay in place and they drive off and she is complaining about the fact that she's slipping off the bike and ultimately she will turn around in such a way that she is sitting on the back of the bike facing forward with bond's left arm across his chest and her right arm up on his shoulder with her left arm controlling the left handlebar and bond's right arm controlling the right handlebar of the bike and we have this chase scene through saigon as they're being chased by suvs and they're both controlling this bike which is pretty cool yeah for the moment where they're getting on the bike the director told each one of them independently, don't let the other one drive the bike. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why they're arguing about it. He said that they did it a couple times, but they used the first take because it was the more natural one. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. So the chase scene continues. They don't know how many people they're being chased by. So she decides that she's going to turn around. She ends up turning around while the bike is driving and sitting in Bond's lap, facing backwards over his shoulder with Bond's hands now both on the, the handlebars of the motorbike. And she starts counting out how many cars they're being chased by. And then she grabs a hook to open a cart full of barrels to stop the cars from chasing them. They make their getaway across a bunch of boats and, and huts and things and ultimately like smash into a building through the roof. The big thing that happens in it is eventually a helicopter catches up with them and starts shooting at them as they're riding along the roofs of these buildings and they end up inside a building and the helicopter has lost sight of them and sort of, so it sort of drops down between the buildings Bond tells Waylon to get back on the back of the bike. And she's like, well, I can't. And he's like, I need to balance the bike, get on the back of the bike. And so she does. And he drives out of this building on the second or third floor, right? And then turns the bike around, drives back through the room that he was just in onto the little deck outside the building and jumps the bike over top of the helicopter, crashing through the roof of the building on the other side of the street. And they make their way down to street level and then the helicopter like finds them again and comes down to street level and like tilts forward to put the rotors right close to the ground and then moves towards the bike as they're trying to escape. Both this and the motorcycle jumping over the helicopter are a great example of what I was talking about earlier with CG because the only thing that's CG in these scenes is the rotors. Oh. So like that bike jump, that was a real jump. That motorcycle actually did that jump over a full-sized helicopter, but the rotors were added in CG because otherwise, holy crap. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I thought it was an amazing stunt. It still is. There are daredevils out there that I would not put past having them jump a motorbike over a helicopter with spinning rotors. <laughs> Like, that doesn't seem that unreasonable to me. Yeah, no, that's true. The scene where the, the helicopter is, like, tilted forward and is chewing up the entire alleyway as it's, like, rotors are going through melon carts and things like that, that feels a little more like, ah, okay, now they have done something to do this because that would be ridiculous ridiculously dangerous in a real helicopter the director worked on a movie called air america and said that while they were filming that someone accidentally put like a tire iron into the rotors of a helicopter and the helicopter did not care and then there was two halves of a tire iron and that's what gave him the inspiration to be like what if they just use the helicopter to like chew through by the way what a stupid and ridiculous and dangerous thing for these henchmen to do <laughs> Yeah. Is this not a Carver Media helicopter? Like, is this not a news copter? <laughs> With the branding, like, right across the side of it? Is it not? I, I can't... 
<laughs> I'm not, I don't recall offhand. It's certainly in the right colors, but I don't see the branding on it. The director, by the way, said that after the amazing tank chase in Goldeneye, he didn't think he could do something with a bigger vehicle. So he decided to go to a smaller vehicle. <laughs> I was like, all right, we'll take it all the way back down to a motorbike. Right. Yeah. So the way they finally get out of this scene is the helicopter does the whole like arcing down thing again, trapping Bond and Waylon in a dead end realizing that they need to come up with something to get them out of this they grab a clothesline that's like bolted to a wall pull it out of the wall and drive directly towards the helicopter and just before they reach the rotors of the helicopter they guttle the bike and slide underneath the helicopter crashing into some rocks behind it and then they stand up and throw the clothesline into the rotors of the helicopter and then dive into a well (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to avoid the ensuing explosion as the helicopter gets its rotors tangled in this clothesline and it goes out of control and smashes into the side of a building and explodes. While it's obviously full of dummies. Yes, obviously full of dummies. This is such a minor nitpick, but I hate that they jump into the well and then the helicopter doesn't explode and then they come back up out of the well and are like, oh, it hasn't. Oh, now it's exploding and then dive back under the water again. <laughs> You know what my minor gripe is? Uh If you're trying to dodge to cover when blowing up a helicopter, maybe don't dodge to the place where if the helicopter lands on top of it, you drown. Yeah, that's fair. That's a... (laughs) <laughs> like get to a place where like you get covered in rubble maybe and then somebody can come to your rescue <laughs> that's a reasonable criticism <laughs> so anyhow we then cut to bond and Waylon in the shower for some reason having a chat about the adventure they just went on and when you say in the shower you don't mean like inside in a hotel room no i mean in an alley there's a water pipe that they're showering in and they're like washing each other's hair They're still clothed. I mean, it is a shower facility, apparently, but it is this outdoor shower thing. Yeah, it's like a public bath. Yeah. And so they're like rinsing each other off and washing each other's hair. And Bond suggests that they should work together because they're clearly working the same case. And while this is happening, Waylon has been picking the lock on her handcuff and she handcuffs Bond to the water pipe and says, nope, I work alone and makes off, leaving Bond kind of stunned, realizing that he's handcuffed to this pipe and he just pulls the pipe off the wall freeing himself and we cut away to Wei Lin arriving at a building and Bond sort of like searching after her in the streets upon getting to this building she is accosted by a bunch of martial arts goons all of whom are here to hurt her and so we have a martial arts fight in this fireworks factory it's not clear what it is there were fireworks in the previous scene which is why i was thinking of it but anyhow it's michelle yo doing martial arts at three guys who are trying to kill her so this is a great time to talk about michelle yo who (laughs) apparently again according to the director was suggested to him by his nephew at the same time that she was suggested to michael wilson by wilson's son (laughs) <laughs> that like independently two younger people with folks on the production team were like you should look at Michelle Yeoh mm. because she'd been in kung fu movies prior to this you know for example she was in Super Cop right and Super Cop 2 you know uh, she'd been in several Jackie Chan movies and indeed was also part of the Jackie Chan stunt team and that's why they decided well we should do a kung fu scene and the normal Bond stunt team weren't like super keen on working with Michelle Yeoh on it because the way that they're trained to do stunts in Hong Kong is that you you hit them. Right. Like you actually, you don't hit as hard as you would if you were doing an actual fight, but you still hit. So they pulled in the Jackie Chan stunt team. Hmm. So the scene is Michelle Yeoh and her coworkers from the Jackie Chan stunt team. They're just doing a Jackie Chan fight. Yeah. Which is why it's great. Obviously, after this movie, she would become even more known to North American audiences for Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon right. in 2000. And then, of course, Memoirs of a Geisha, voice work in stuff like Kung Fu Panda, and most recently, Philippa Giorgio in Star Trek Discovery. Yeah, and apparently also to be in Avatars 2, 3, 4, and 5. Uh, yeah, evidently. <laughs> That's too many avatars. (laughs) And also Shang-Chi in The Legend of the Ten Rings, Ah. which I am much looking forward to. Michelle Yeoh is great. And this scene is awesome and just a really good kung fu fight scene. 
Yeah. I like Michelle Yeoh is great in this movie and well used. Yes. This movie is doing the thing where Bond and a female agent from a rival intelligence organization end up paired together and having to do spy things together. And this movie does it really well. She's a good, competent agent that is never one step behind. Like she's always on the same step of the investigation as Bond is. And she's super capable in a fight and is hyper competent and at no point requires Bond to step in and save her. She's just a spy doing her own thing and for a while decides to not work with Bond and then ends up working with Bond. And by working together, they accomplish things that they could not accomplish working alone. And everyone lives happily ever after. And it's just like, it's really good. <laughs> yeah, she's great. She's great in this movie and she's just great in general. I just appreciate that they don't undermine her character at all. Yeah. There's one scene in this scene where like at the end of the scene, one of the goons gets the upper hand on her by pointing a gun at her. And Bond just happens to have caught up with them at the time and like bonks him on the head. And he's like, all right, saved your life. And she's like, I had him. And you completely believe that she was in no danger, right? Like, oh, yeah, she totally did have it. And Bond saved the day, but he didn't need to. The only possible undercutting of the character from one particular angle that I found sort of interesting is in a few scenes when they're sort of like suiting up for the final confrontation. Bond sort of talks about like, it's a shame that we could never, you know, work together more seriously. Or could we maybe? And she sort of says, I can't remember exactly the wording, but it's basically like, I don't have a little red book on me, if that's what you're wondering. I actually think that exchange is really good. Like, it's a funny exchange, but it's to me, it's like, you know, Bond is like queen and country, rule Britannia, rah, rah, rah. And this is her being like, oh, no, no, don't worry. I'm not that communist. But it is in the context of not just Bond being like queen and country, rah, 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 because she's like, oh, they told me all about these corrupt, decadent Western powers and you're not that bad. And he's like, well, you know, at least you found the right corrupt, decadent Western agent to partner with. And then he sort of quips about her being, you know, aligned with the communist regime in China. And she's like, well, not really. <laughs> we aren't that communist. The whole thing is them basically playing off stereotypes of their own histories as perceived by the other in this context. So it comes across to me as quite playful. Okay, yeah, though that's that's fair. I had forgotten about sort of the context there, but that one line had really stuck in my head. So I was like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So anyway, rewinding to where we are now in the movie, it's the the Q scene is really what this is. It is. It is the Q scene. But Bond is the one that's kind of like out of his element in this one, which I quite like. Yeah. Waylon flips a couple buttons and the room transforms into her like hideout. And there's like an armory and there's computers and everything. And Bond is like, all right, you get the gear together. I'll send the messages to our governments that we're going to work together. And then sees the keyboard is all in Chinese characters. And he's like, OK, tell you what, you send the messages. I'll get the gear together. And so as he's into the gear together he starts like touching things he's not supposed to touch and being surprised that things do secret things that he wasn't expecting and Waylon just sort of looks at him witheringly at one point they had considered actually having like a Chinese Q branch kind of guy in here but ended up just making it bond bumbling across stuff which I think is probably plays way funnier yeah the fan that fires all the wires is funny the best bit is when he's like almost finished and he walks over and he just puts his hand on a statue and the statue just blows fire and he yelps and leaps backwards that's <laughs> yeah. that's really good <laughs> he's just like ah yeah the one thing I like most in this scene is he finds the new model Walther and is like, huh, you know, I asked you to get me one of these. <laughs> 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 and he takes the gun i like that he finds his watch too or not his watch but like the mi6 rolex and he's like oh look at this she's like yeah we actually made some improvements to it <laughs> <laughs> they're trying to figure out where there could possibly be a stealth ship they've they've figured out it has to be a stealth ship but they don't know where it could be and they've narrowed it down to somewhere in Heilong bay right and standing in for Heilong bay is the area near phuket 
which they used in Man with the Golden Gun. And in fact, in one of the shots, there's a couple wide shots where you see the junk that they're riding. They got a local fisherman to take them near where they need to go. Mm -hmm. In one of the shots, you can just see the very tall needle island that the satellite reflectors rise out of in Man with a Golden Gun. <laughs> right, yeah. Just beside what is known as James Bond Island. <laughs> Eventually, the fisherman takes them as far as he's willing to go, and they continue in their little inflatable raft, and they check, you know, all the possible bays. They're like, oh, you know, there's a transition, and it's like, all right, this is the last one, and it's almost nighttime. And then they finally spot... The stealth ship. The stealth ship. Now, I mentioned that this movie followed Titanic in one other way, because all the seafaring scenes in and around the stealth ship are a combination of a set at Pinewood Film Studios... Right. Like the inside the catamaran underneath the ship is a set in the pinewood tank. There are miniatures which were shot in the Titanic tank where they were filming Titanic. Right. And the Titanic production was running a little long <laughs> by a few <laughs> days. And Tomorrow Never Dies was in there like right after. Right. And so they were sort of like the producers for this movie were getting a little nervous <laughs> <laughs> that they might not make schedule because Titanic was running a little long. But they do eventually find the boat and they are planning just to blow it up. So they drive in underneath the catamaran. They haven't spotted them coming and they're placing explosive charges on it. And then inside, we see that Carver is aboard and they fire one of the rockets and then a nearby British ship, the HMS Bedford, is almost hit by one of the rockets. Basically, their plan is they're going to fire near misses at both sides because I think he says that like the Chinese will think that the British are sending a warning shot and the British will think that the Chinese are rattling their sabers or whatever it yeah, is that he it, says. It, it's, it, they'll think the British are rattling their sabers and the, uh, the British will think the Chinese are being belligerent mm -hmm. is the line. Yeah, that happens. And then Carver notices that the the man watching the security cameras has fallen asleep because he sees Wei Lin on the security cameras and says, if she's here, Bond is here and tells Stamper to go and find them. And they do indeed grab Wei Lin. Bond sees this happen and manages to sneak aboard the ship. <laughs> By faking his own death. It's actually quite clever. He knows there's a guy coming to get him, so he gets his knife out and stabs him just as he comes through the door, grabs his gun, uses that to lay like suppressing fire, but giving away his location to Stamper, and then leans the corpse of the guy that he's just killed out just enough that Stamper takes some shots at him and then drops the corpse into the ocean, <laughs> making Stamper think that he's killed Bond. It's very good. And gives Bond the ability to have some freedom to move around the ship and set up some traps before for revealing his presence to the crew again. There's a very strange scene that I don't particularly like where Carver is having a mini monologue at Wei Lin and then mentions that Bond is dead, which she is not happy to hear and tries to attack him with Kung Fu and gets restrained by his minions. And then he does this like mocking Kung Fu thing where he's like, oh, what, oh, like waving his arms around and making like weird Bruce Lee noises. And it's like, what this... <laughs> It really kind of makes his character seem like sort of childish. Yeah. Which has not been the case so far. Not in that way. Yeah, it, it does. It's just silly. It's not yeah. menacing or in keeping with his character, really. He's just, it just makes him a dick. <laughs> yeah. There's a brief cut back to London where M bursts into the mission control room where Palmer is getting ready to basically go to war. And she's like, yo, hold up. Got this communique from Bond. Look for a stealth ship. Here's how you find it. It's going to be nearby. And they radio to the ship and they keep an eye out for it. They, they, like, they do eventually find it, but not right away. Mm -hmm. We see Bond sneaking around while Carver is showing off the plan with the British missile that they stole and how they're going to use that to fire it into Beijing. Beijing, yeah. They're going to fire it right into Beijing. Kill a whole bunch of innocent people to start this war. And we see Bond, he does this cool thing. He finds a jar in the mess, pulls the pin on a grenade, puts the grenade in the glass jar, takes a charge thing out of his wristwatch, tapes it to the jar, and then leaves it near some fuel tanks. And th that'll be relevant later. Yeah, with the, with the jar holding the fuse lever still in place. Yeah, 
Bond then gets Gupta at gunpoint and is basically trying to make a hostage trade for Wei Lin. Carver asks Gupta, oh, is everything ready to go with this, by the way? And Gupta very happily is like, oh, yes, just press a button and Beijing goes away. And Carver's like, oh, okay, then I guess we don't need you anymore and shoots Gupta. Gupta, not a big strategic thinker. (laughs) No, no, really not. So then Bond hits the thing on his watch. The small charge breaks the glass. Then the paddle goes off the grenade and then it blows up and makes a huge explosion because of the fuel tanks, allowing the ship to be seen on the radar from the British boat. They contact the Chinese who also see it and they both basically make this agreement of like, okay, we're going to let this ride for now and not do a war. And the British and the Chinese agree to let the British try to take care of this ship. If they don't, then then maybe we will do a war. But, you know, we'll let you sort of sort that out first. Right. I'm not a huge fan of the interior space on this ship. I, it, like, it is big, but it doesn't feel big. No, like, it's trying to do the big evil secret layer of a Bond villain thing, but it's it's a little too constrained to really feel grandiose. It feels very cramped, yeah. And I I guess that's kind of what they were going for to an extent, but I, I don't know. I think it's to do probably with how it's shot which and to be fair i've not had a lot of complaints with how this movie as a whole is shot but just this the evil lair it's just it's so full of stuff and girders and beams and this thing in the middle the missile in the middle it just sort of yeah it feels very constrained and i i don't like it i i wish that there was a little more grandiose weight to it i know what you mean most of my sort of complaints about the the movie generally has been sort of editing related including a couple shots coming up that are in not appropriately shot slow motion oh yeah done in post so there's clearly just not enough frames to make the slow motion work and i do not like it oh yeah no they're terrible i noticed those too in all of the chaos Bond and Waylin get away and then split up again to do different things. Waylin's going to go and destroy the engines while Bond is going to try and deal with Carver and the missile. The the stealth ship is being actively shelled by the British at this point. Waylin has a cool scene in the engine room where she's got two guns two automatic weapons. There's a lot of I mean they both do. Like they both have two guns for a lot of this. It's very very action movie for parts of this it really is especially when bond grabs like a rocket launcher array (laughs) like manages to move it by hand and starts firing rockets around like inside inside the the ship yeah yeah there there's a weird thing i noticed in this scene when i was watching it that while bond is running around he's using his walther and like an smg and at some point a silencer appears on the walther (laughs) Oh, I didn't notice that. But the sound effects never apply a silenced sound effect. Huh. It always just goes bang, bang, <laughs> even though he's running around with this Walther with a, a silencer on it. But they never actually do the thing where he puts the silencer on it. Anyhow, it, it was a really minor thing. I just I noticed it when I was watching it last night. And since it bothered me, it has to bother you. Yeah, no, that that I didn't notice it. But now that you've said it, it absolutely bothers me. <laughs> <laughs> So Bond ends up in a pile of flaming rubble, which also gets shot at by Stamper because they're being shelled still by the British naval ship. So Stamper and Carver think that Bond is finally well and truly dead. But of course, that is not the case as Bond bursts into the control room. But Carver gets the drop on Bond and holds him at gunpoint. Bond notices the controls for the weird oceanic drill device on like the control panel so turns around to position himself so that he's facing carver so that carver can you know have one last final monologue while bond's back is to the drill controls turns the drill on which distracts carver just briefly enough for bond to jump him and grab him and hold him there while the drill moves closer and closer towards them and then instead of like throwing carver forward into the drill he just holds carver there until the drill is quite close and then lets go and backs away but there's definitely enough time for carver to have gotten away (laughs) carver just sort of stands there going ah and then the drill we we don't see it chew carver to little pieces we see it chew like the thing that carver was standing in front of so it's not gory but it's the implication is awful obviously i'm surprised they didn't put a red smear on the blades of the drill at least there's some on bond but it's hard to tell if it's from that or from just all the other stuff he's been doing yeah 
but yeah you're right considering the like the printing press earlier in the film i'm surprised they didn't at least glorify the drill bit Mm -hmm. yeah so there's your bond villain grotesquely dying yep I realized as we were talking about this that I wrote an essay deconstructing this scene as part of my master's degree. <laughs> you what? I remembered it. I found I found the essay. I found the essay. Oh my god, what? Yeah, it was a it was a an essay that was assigned to us to compare the structure and events of a typical climax of a Bond film versus the climax of the film Casino Royale and what the intent of those two sequences are. And it was Tomorrow Never Dies that was selected as the typical Bond climax. Wow. And I did, in fact, note that Carver gets the typical gory, like gruesome death. <laughs> <laughs> of a bond villain what else <laughs> oh uh, well all right let's go through the point form notes so a typical bond climax it is structured as a standard action climax action rises over the course of the sequence growing more and more intense as the film nears its highest point numerous active characters and subplots within the climax sequence bond carver Waylon, stamper and the crew of the hms bedford m and the minister of defense scenes of high action broken up by periods of rest rest scenes take the form of expository dialogue and cuts to secondary characters not involved directly in the action action scenes tend to grow longer and rest scenes tend to become shorter as the scene progresses stakes are very high bond is averting a global disaster tension is added to the scene in three significant ways there's use of time pressure there are several countdown timers that are set in place over the course of the sequence for which is indicated that the completion of the countdown will result in death or mission failure for bond there is romantic tension illustrated between the character of waylin and bond over the course of the climax sequence she is twice used to force bond into a position of having to choose the girl or the mission in and in classic bond fashion he finds a way to do both there's collateral action throughout the film's climax the stealth ship on which is occurring is under attack by the hms bedford as the sequence progresses the shells get progressively closer until at the height of the action they finally connect and the ship begins to explode. Bond is placed at risk at several points throughout the climax, as is Waylin. However, the greatest threat presented to the lives of either results from the collateral action. In the case of Bond, he is caught in one of the HMS Bedford's shells and Waylin is nearly drowned after being dropped into the sea while Bond is busy fighting the last major villain. As the sequence reaches its high point and subsequent resolution, the threads of tension that have been running through the climax are paid off. The core antagonists of the film are killed in fairly spectacular and gruesome ways paying off the tension built through the rising action bond narrowly averts the plan of the plan of the villains and escapes just before the countdown to the villains missile launch ends the missile explodes upon launch paying off the tension built through uh the addition of time pressure and bond rescues waylin and they reach safety in romantic embrace paying off the romantic tension built throughout the scene the emotional and action climaxes of the film correspond and complement one another ending on a high point bond saves the day gets the girl and rides or floats off into the sunset there you go that's the rest of the scene <laughs> that's the rest of the scene <laughs> So once again, one of the things we hit here, having just watched Carver die, is again, henchman number one gets the final boss fight. Yeah, because Bond is trying to deactivate the missile launch thing. Yeah, and Carver's not really like a boss fight, right? Like he's not a heavy. He's not a he's not a warrior of any kind. No, he's not. The only way you can get a boss fight in this movie is to make Stamper the boss fight. Yeah. So after Carver's death, Bond goes to deactivate the missile that's going to be launched at Beijing. He climbs up onto the scaffold and Stamper climbs up after him and they have a fight. The fight essentially resolves when Bond manages to trap Stamper's foot by unlocking the missile and the, the missile drops down onto his foot. So when the missile launches it will immolate stamper and as bond tries to escape stamper grabs bond's vest and holds him in front of the exhaust vent of the missile so that he's like well if i die we're gonna die together bond manages to free himself by reaching up and pulling a knife out of stamper that he had previously stabbed stamper with and cuts himself free of his like flak vest and drops into the sea this entire fight has been taking place as Wei Lin has been dropped into the water like all chained up and so bond drops into the water the missile goes off it immolates stamper he frees Wei Lin from the chains and they rise to the surface as the stealth ship explodes the ship gets completely destroyed and somehow <laughs> doesn't harm bond or Wei Lin at all oh they're on underwater and as we know explosions can't go underwater but like debris though <laughs> it's the debris i was thinking of it can't know. all float the explosion sent it upwards that's how that works i'm fairly certain that's how that works 
So anyhow, they climb aboard the wreckage. There's a brief discontinuity that I don't like in the last five minutes of this film because we cut back to MI6. A message is delivered to MI6. It's like, ah, well, the Bedford has has blown up the stealth ship. It was there. It seems like Bond has made it and, you know, we'll report back to you soon. And then it cuts back to Bond and Wei Lin lying on this floating wreckage, not unlike the end of Titanic, except that in this case, they are smooching like Bond does with his female compatriot at the end of every Bond movie as the Bedford is like sailing around looking for them with like a mm-hmm. spotlight because it's after dark Waylin comments it's like oh i think they're looking for us should we get their attention and bond is like no let's stay undercover and they continue smooching floating atop this ship wreckage in the middle of the south china sea and that's how the movie ends and the discontinuity is that how do they know bond has made it if they're still searching for bond <laughs> <laughs> i do i do like in that mi6 scene that M is having a lot of fun coming up with the news story for Carver's death. Yes. She tells Moneypenny, she's like, he died on his private yacht in the South China Sea. Authorities believe he committed suicide. (laughs) And yeah, that's 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 the movie. We get a end plate of in loving memory of Albert R. Cubby Broccoli. And then the end credits with the song Surrender, the refrain of which is Tomorrow Never Dies. Yeah. That was it. Yep. All right. So what'd you think? It was all right. It was all right. It was neither the worst nor the best Bond movie. Yeah, I didn't hate it, certainly. But as I'm sure you can tell from the difference in my effusive praise between last episode and this, that this was (laughs) just kind of less of a well-made movie. Yeah. You know? Yeah. There were some great parts that I really enjoyed, and there were some parts that were just kind of like, eh, this seems kind of bungled together. I don't understand a lot of Paris's motivations. I don't really get her character, to be honest. Yeah. She's just there to do what needs to be done in the scene. Yeah. Jonathan Price is great and is having a blast doing what he's doing, but I think Carver is a very non-threatening villain and i think his plans are just very silly yeah gupta is not that interesting stamper is a good enough heavy i love michelle yo i think waylin is great in this movie and i still think pierce brosnan is really great as bond and we get a little bit more of his take on it in this movie yes i agree i feel like he he comes into it a little more in this one than he he did in goldmine yeah but overall it's just kind of okay agreed (laughs) (laughs) i have i have no nothing else to add i feel much the same way which worries me because at the time i recall thinking that the brosnan movies were sort of a linear progression downwards over the course of them i have bad news for you graham well i know what's coming in the future (laughs) i'm more worried about next episode because if the world is not enough is as much of a step down from tomorrow never dies as this was from goldeneye then i'm very very worried (laughs) well we'll cross that bridge when we come to it i guess yeah so pre-title sequence terrorist arms bazaar it's fine it is it's totally fine it's no golden eye it's no no russia with love it's no license to kill the stunt isn't as good as the spy who loved me or moonraker i think this goes between moonraker and you only live twice for me okay it like it's a good fun explosive high energy once it gets going it takes forever to get there but once it gets to like the excitement it's exciting. It has a little hook for the the plot of the movie, but not a big one, not an obvious one. But it's big and bombastic and fun. Is it better than You Only Live Twice? Maybe it's not. Maybe You Only Live Twice has a better hook. Live and Let Die. I really like Live and Let Dies. Living Daylights. I would say, actually, you know what? I'm going to downgrade that. I think this is more in the same realm as Living Daylights. Yeah, I'm going... I don't want to tell you how to live your life. I'm going a lot lower with this one. It just didn't grab me as a pre-title. Like, Mm. it was cool, but, like, there wasn't really a stunt. Like, there was the action sequence with the planes. Yeah, you're right. It's, It's like it's not a stunt. It's an action scene. Yeah. 
And like the stuff back at MI6 was cool. Like I like seeing Judy Dench and Jeffrey Palmer play off one another, but I don't know. Yeah, I think I think I'm downgrading this to Between Living Daylights and View to a Kill. Because View to a Kill is like the second skiing sequence that's totally undermined by the music, like the snowboarding bit. And Living Daylights is another action scene that's that's really good, but is way quicker on getting to the action. Like I think this and Living Daylights are of a kind, right? Whereas Living Daylights is like, this is a training exercise gone wrong and it starts with a stunt and then moves into an action scene this is we are watching an operation underway and we're watching the boring part first (laughs) as the hook into the movie don't get me wrong i love procedural stuff but the drama of the ops room is not what i want to open a bond movie on so yeah i i think i think this goes between view to a kill and and living daylights for me i'm happy to put it there all right i'm going a little bit lower i like view to a kill and man with a golden gun more than this as an opening for basically for all the reasons you just said but more so (laughs) yeah fair enough (laughs) so the song tomorrow never dies with cheryl crow woof (laughs) it's just not It's just not that interesting, is it? No, it's not. The problem is, I think a lot of the Bond music is really good. So I'm looking at my list and I'm like, yeah, that song rules. 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 Like, wait, where in the list did the song stop ruling? And it's quite low. And again, I think the song is fine. It just, I lack object permanence in relation to it. It ceases to exist the moment I'm not actively hearing it. Once you stop observing the song. Yeah. I think this one goes somewhere in the realm of Moonraker. I, like, I'm looking down this list, and I'm trying to find the one that I can no longer conjure it to mind. And the answer is, I can conjure every one of these songs to mind. So I can't use that as my benchmark. Like, it's a fine song. I, I think From Russia With Love is a good song. I think Nobody Does It Better is an okay to good song. License to Kill is strictly better than this. <sighs> So I think this goes down around Moonraker for me. I think this might go above Moonraker. I I really don't like the Moonraker theme very much. And I think everything below the Moonraker theme is objectively bad. (laughs) So I'm going to put this above Moonraker and below from Russia with love. I'm putting it in almost the same place. I'm putting it just after The Spy Who Loved Me and above Octopussy, which is like one lower than you. Yeah, although our our ordering is a little different down there. Yeah. You really are not a keen on From Russia With Love, apparently. In, in a similar way to this, it just made no impression on me. Yeah. All right, movie as a whole. Well, it's definitely not my top three. No, no, it's not, which is a shame because there's moments in it I like, but just as a movie... You know, like, like we talked last time, right? Like, it's just not as lovingly constructed as I want a movie to be. Yeah. And, and I mean, we know why, but that doesn't help. I'm trying to figure out where this fits in my list. I, I think it belongs in the same ballpark as The Living Daylights, License to Kill, View to a Kill. That's the dead center of my list, and I think it sort of still lives in that area. I'm relatively certain I'll get hate mail if I put it above Goldfinger. <laughs> I'm putting it about in that realm also. I'm going to be putting it between... God, this is the moment where it's like you look at your previous scores and you're like, what was I thinking? But yeah. I'm I'm going to be putting it between You Only Live Twice and License to Kill. Okay. All right. I, I think I am going one step lower than you in this regard. I think I am putting this below Goldfinger. And not just because I expect to get hate mail if I do otherwise, but I'm looking at the list of movies that's in my middle third, right? And it's like, would I rather watch this than The Living Daylights? I don't think so. Would I rather watch this than License to Kill? That's a tougher call. Would I Would I rather watch this than A View to a Kill? Mm, no, I think I'd rather watch A View to a Kill. And then I'm like, all right, okay, so it doesn't fit in that group. So let's look down. What would I rather watch this than? And I think the answer is I'd rather watch this than The Man with the Golden Gun. Goldfinger is quite a ways down my list, and I still think it's a pretty good movie, <laughs> despite mm-hmm. having some things that, like, don't work. The reason Goldfinger sits so low is that well, we exposed a bunch of stuff that is like, this doesn't make any sense. There are some things in this movie that are kind of distasteful and undermine it, but so much of what's there actually still does work really well that it's actually still a lot of fun to watch. 
but it's it's like a loose kind of sloppy movie actually and i feel like this is the same way it's like this is a very rote by the numbers film that comes together but doesn't have the detail and flourish of the better films it's fun to watch and some people are really going ham on it but it just does not manage to be more than the sum of its parts and i think that damns it to the realm of <laughs> banishing it to the shadow realm of uh <laughs> of the man with the golden gun so i i think tomorrow never dies goes between goldfinger and the man with the golden gun for me uh, i definitely uh, rather watch it than thunderball so it couldn't go much lower what what an aberration that movie is because i have man with a golden gun way higher on my list than yours i know and well and and goldfinger i have goldfinger way lower on my list than yours it's in your top five and it's in like my bottom six so yeah it probably won't it probably won't finish in the top five but we'll see yeah did did we forget to do a bond moment for goldeneye probably we we've been sort of doing them as a component of the the review itself rather than making it a discrete thing at the end we've been very inconsistent with it true it is not so much a traditional element or formal element of this podcast as it is a thing we do when we remember to do it but what was your bond moment of this film it's probably it's not particularly suave but it's probably when he kills dr kaufman when it's like, please, I'm just a professional doing my job. And Bond is like, so am I. Yeah, that's a good one. You know what? I'm going to go in the other direction. I think my like most Bond moment is Bond dropping the car into the Avis rental shop. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's actually that's that's also spectacular. Yeah, it's it, like it's just goofy enough and he's having just enough fun with it that it plays really well for me. I think it's cute and clever. Well, there we are. That is going to do it for Tomorrow Never Dies. Uh, next time, we're still in the 90s. We're looking at 1999's The World Is Not Enough. And I mean, I guess now I'm trepidatious. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I remember elements of this film. I just remember that Denise Richards is completely unconvincing in her given role. There's that. There's Christmas and Turkey. Don't don't remember that. Okay. There's uh, giant saw blades suspended from helicopters. Don't remember that. There are snowmobiles on parachutes. Uh, that sounds familiar, but that could have been any Bond movie. All right. Well, there are lots to look forward to. <laughs> Can't wait. All right. Yeah. Well, until then, I want to thank you, Matt, for joining me for these. Thank you, Graham. I want to thank Featherweight for the art. I want to thank Matt Griffiths for the wonderful work on the video edit. Do check it out if you are listening to this as audio only or or not. I mean, if you're listening audio only, you probably have good reason for that. And that's totally cool. And thank you for listening. And Heather, who does podcast admin. And thank you, all of you, for your support of our Patreon at patreon.com slash loading ready run. That is going to do it for Tomorrow Never Dies. Until next time. This podcast will return. Mm -hmm.